are getting word from the Oklahoma City Fire Department that there are people trapped inside the building. They believe they are alive. They are trapped in the rubble. And the Oklahoma City Fire Department trying to get those folks out. So when more bomb scares or bomb devices are found and everybody has to clear out, that just delays that rescue effort as well. But again, we're getting confirmation from the Oklahoma City Fire Department that people are trapped inside the rubble of the federal building. And they're trying to get those folks out right now. Uh, one of the things that you had perhaps uh, heard us mention earlier and have not heard us say for a while, we might want to mention one more time, we did receive a phone call earlier this morning, uh, shortly after this occurred, from somebody claiming responsibility. If you can imagine someone wanting to claim that, what you're seeing on your screen right now, part of the sick politics involved in terrorism. But somebody called uh, News Channel 4 and tried to claim responsibility, saying that they were with the Nation of Islam. We have not been able to confirm that report. We are still working on that. Uh, we certainly do not want to do a disservice uh, to the Islamic community, uh, so please take that with uh, the spirit that it is intended, and that is that that is an unconfirmed phone call that we received earlier this morning. Okay, let's go to Ken Ogle. He is on the phone at University Hospital. Ken, what do you have for us there? Right now we have 11 kids and four adults, 11 kids over at Children's Trauma Center right now. The families of these children are being sent. An incredibly tragic story out of Oklahoma City this morning. A blast ripped through this six-story Alfred Murray Federal Building at 5th and Robinson Streets. For those of you who are familiar with Oklahoma City, the uh, damage is um, it's, it's devastating. Uh, six children are believed uh, to have lost their lives in the daycare center where 30 children were, and they don't know how many people may be injured or killed still inside the building. We will continue to follow this. In downtown Oklahoma City, a six-story building, but you can see that uh, a significant chunk of the front of this building was completely obliterated by this explosion. Now, there are reports that FBI agents have found a second bomb, possibly two other explosive devices in or near that building. The devices have not been detonated. And uh, again, people have been running from the scene. Uh, and a lot of injuries happened when people began running from the building in, in, in a panic. Now, it is difficult, very difficult, to get through on the phone lines to Oklahoma City. We are going to give you two phone numbers that they have given out there. Uh, can we put those phone numbers on the screen? There we go, the command post to call and check on loved ones. There's the phone number, area code 405-820-6801 or 6806. That's for the command post. And here is the Red Cross hotline, 405-232-7121, 405-232-7121. This is taped from earlier today, some of the people being removed from the scene. Of course, the hospitals are just being flooded with victims, and a lot of people were actually treated at the scene uh, for minor injuries or at least not as serious as uh, some of those who had been injured and taken in ambulances to nearby hospitals. You can still see people, even in this earlier tape, running about, really not knowing what to do. Are these live pictures now? Apparently this, is, this is continues to be taped, but uh, the situation there is still very tense in Oklahoma City, and we're going to continue uh, covering this story and bring you the very, very latest as we now switch into our O.J. Simpson trial coverage, and we'll continue to update the situation in Oklahoma City. See you tomorrow. I see the world's biggest guitar. I see me right now. I have late information for you. We are going to stay with this. This is unedited videotape, as you can see at the bottom of your screen. We are going to stay with this. We're waiting for a news conference. The governor of Oklahoma, I believe, is supposed to be speaking soon. This uh, explosion apparently was felt for miles around. It rocked the downtown federal office building. The entire front of the structure, as you can see, was blown away. There is rubble in the streets. The black plume of smoke. They under, uh, I understand there are numerous injuries. Some fatalities have been reported. And this situation started early this morning. Uh, early this morning, our time, approximately uh, 7 15, 7 30, our time, about 9 15 in the morning. Just about the time office workers had gotten settled in. Most federal office buildings have workers going in about 8 o'clock, so the employees were in the buildings. There have also been numerous evacuations in the immediate area. Television and radio stations have received bomb threats. 
I also understand that a Christian church in the area, a preschool, has also received a bomb threat. They are asking people in the area to please stay at home, do not come out. Right now, this is, not, uh, this is not the time. We do have a hotline number for you that we will put up. If you have family or friends who work in that area, we'll get that for you in just a moment. They are Red Cross numbers that you can call if you want to inquire about family members or friends, loved ones. Those are the only numbers that you should call. The force of the explosion could be felt as far as 30 miles away. And uh, it is a, a tremendous explosion. Here's the Red Cross hotline number, 232-7171. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to wait for our, for our producer. It's area code 405. It is area code 405. This is a feed directly from a television station in Oklahoma City. The command post, 820-6801. To 6806, and once again, that's area code 405. Okay, we are now going to listen live to coverage from the station in Oklahoma City. And some of the other states, state buildings, Governor? Well, I can't say specifically what security measures are being taken, but certainly sufficient measures will be taken. And uh, the House and Senate has adjourned. Both of them have adjourned until Monday. So this building is uh, virtually shut down. All right, so we need to tell all non essential state employees to head home. Uh, everybody with the Health Sciences Center, anybody in the medical business or obviously the public safety business stay at work to help out. Is Absolutely. that correct? Okay. Governor, we sure appreciate you joining us. Anything you. else you want to add? No, not a thing. All right. Thank, thank you. you. About uh, 30 minutes ago, there was a threat of a second explosive device, which we told you was just disarmed by apparently the Oklahoma County bomb squad a short time ago. Uh, when that was happening, we got an interview with one of the people running from the scene. Let's take a look at that right now. What had happened, whatever happened, happened. Just the roar of the whole building crumbling. And for where I was sitting, the only place the floor didn't cave in. I mean, right over here, the floor was gone. And so the floor that you were sitting on didn't cave, but all around you it did? No, where I, my little area where I was sitting. But the. I was on the seventh floor, and then, of course, the eighth floor came down and went through, and then they just kept on going down. And this is a, there was a window to a hall by my desk, and I crawled, crawled over it and got out. And went, the stairwell was still lit. The light was on in the stairwell. Do you and know if there are other survivors? Did you see there's a, any casualties? Did you see people that had died? I don't know. I know that some people were still in the building. They hadn't gotten to yet. I saw a lot of people very badly hurt. Did you see anybody else getting out? Yeah, there were... People were just getting out covered with blood and just stunned. I mean, it was just... shock. Get out! Get them ready. I think he said another bomb. Oh my god, another bomb. <laughs> Now, we do understand that the explosion was actually felt for a 50-mile radius. 
People did not know if it was an explosion. It probably felt a great deal like an earthquake. People were in their cars. They felt it on bridges and overpasses. Now, a second bomb has been found by the firefighters. It has, it is unexploded, but when this happened, people absolutely panicked. They ran out into the street. They trampled one another. And this, of course, is hampering rescue efforts because the firefighters were afraid this second bomb could, could explode. And uh, as I, I understand, there are no reports of fatalities right now, but with the tremendous amount of rubble and uh, what we have seen that happened to the front of that building and certainly down into the street, we are simply going to have to wait for further reports. A uh, great deal, as you can see, Red Cross uh, looks like a volunteer to me. The, the streets are absolutely filled with people. This, is, uh, this has created a great concern in cities throughout the United States, not just in Oklahoma City. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, that uh, they are asking people to please stay at home. We have shown you the phone numbers to call if you have family or friends who live in Oklahoma City. And, in, and those numbers are in the 405 area code area. Here it is, 405 232 7121 they will be able to help you it's a red cross hotline much as the the same as the hotlines that we have had established here in southern california when we have had a disaster another the command post 405-820-6801 to 6806 now let's listen to the coverage from oklahoma city about 15 minutes ago this is this is a rescue from the Alfred P. Murrow building. You can see a firefighter helping a man down a ladder. It looks like from the third or fourth floor of that uh, federal building in downtown Oklahoma City. That is uh, maybe the fourth or fifth person we have seen Come down. taken out of the building uh, since about 9.30 this morning. I think uh, R.D. is uh, joining us now. Tell us about what you saw out there. Okay, that man works in the agricultural department towards the uh, east part of the building. Uh, you might have seen that. There was some several uh, marble concrete uh, facade on that building, some of which is, is now uh, is gone. He uh, said that uh, he heard the explosion. He got under his desk. Another man was with him. He also got under his desk. And uh, they, I asked them about the front part of the building, the part that we're seeing that's most heavily damaged, what part of the building that is, how many people are normally there. He said a lot of people, a lot of secretaries, that kind of thing, a lot of offices. He, he says that he saw several people just lying. He, he stayed under his uh, desk until somebody yelled for him to come out and that they were ready to rescue him. Was he on the south side of the building? He was on the east side east of the side. building. East side of the building. In the agriculture. Now this is what you're seeing is what they have considered evidence, some kind of evidence, and they had everyone moving back. You okay, sir? Yeah, I'm fine. That was quite, quite miraculous, wasn't it? Thank, thank God I'm alive. All right, yes, sir. What's your name, sir? Uh, I'm Brian Espy. Okay. Did you work up there? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're going to take him down to the corner. I've got a phone right here. Can you hear okay? I'm fine. Are you? Yeah. How do you think that happened? I happen to be in the part of the, the only part of the fifth floor, our part of the fifth floor that didn't go on. It's either a bomb or a gas explosion from across the street. I, I just happen to be in that room. It's not the room I normally am in. I was working on a project. And I happened to was lucky I've had a table to dive under. What went, um, what went through your mind? Where's the table what, to get under? Well, yeah. Where, what's happening? You know, it, 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 it's like it happened in slow motion. What are some it's, of the images that, that you, uh, while you waited to be rescued, went through your mind? Uh, well, the same ones that are going, you know, my, my entire staff of about seven people is gone. Just he and I and one lady are the only ones that walk out of our floor area. Did, right. did you see any any uh, fatalities? No, because no, just there, a big there's hole. no floor. The ceiling right. to there's, the basement. Right. There's, there's nothing, nothing there. Does it make any sense to you? No. no. But it's like a dream still. It just, it's not real. If, if somebody does did this, what what could be their vote? I don't have any history. Well, I, I, I'm thankful that you're okay. Thank you. No, I'm Jack Gobin. Where, where do you work, Jack? We work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. He's a veterinarian, and I work for the Plant Protection and Coordination. Well, looking at this building, it seems impossible anybody well, could walk out of it. 
I thought it was an earthquake because I, I resided in California for many years and it was almost like slow motion. I, I felt a, a shake and then it began shaking more and I, I, I dove under my desk and then the glass all came in. I think that helped save me. The, all the glass was gone. It's all over the office. Where, where, where's your office located? Can you point to it? Here on the fifth floor, right on the end. The only, I can walk from here, from my office to the door where I normally enter, and there's nothing there anymore. It's just, it's from me to these individuals that the building's gone. So, so tell me about the building, the, the part that I'm looking at that I'm seeing the most destruction. What, what is that? What's there? Well, for our section, that's our main office area. The only office that were spared was mine and my secretary and my officer, and then a little section of a conference room, which Dr. Espy happened to be sitting in. The whole rest of the office is gone. Can you estimate how many people might be working in there at any given time like today? Get him back! Get him back! Get him back! This is, this is happening where they, they found the second bomb. I was interviewing the man, you saw that. All of a sudden, 200 people start running towards me, and they just, get back, get back, get back. They found another bomb, and we got back at least seven blocks, and I think they're still pushing people back. And I, for all practical purposes, it's a... So you won't be seeing very many more... What we're looking at right now is uh, videotape... Okay, what we're looking at right now is videotape that was shot shortly after the second bomb was found. Uh, people running down the street. Uh, you can see that uh, the disaster area is a very, very large area. We understand now that there is a... KFOR now in Oklahoma City. You know, here's Oklahoma. How this happen in Oklahoma City? Indeed, a lot of people asking that question. Baptist Minister Dave Brinkley. We're now on the... Associated Press computer wire. Federal agents say they are treating this as a bombing. So, as we've told you, there are word of another, there's word of another explosive device within the building, and they're looking for that one now, trying to get it out of there as they try and get people trapped in the rubble of the federal building out and into some kind of medical care. Lee Evans at the update desk right now has something new for us. Lee. Lee, are you with us? Yes, we apparently have had another uh, bomb threat this morning. According to a church volunteer at First Christian Church in Edmond, that is uh, in downtown Edmond at First and Boulevard, this morning there was a bomb threat at the church. A note was left and police were called. Now there's a daycare center and all the staff and all the children were evacuated from there. Police searched through the church, found nothing, and everyone is back in the church now. Uh, well, the note was signed. There was a bomb threat left by a note. The note was signed, Dimension. I'm not sure what that means, but it's spelled D-E-M-E-N-T-I-A. I hope I'm saying that right. The note was signed Dementia, and it was a bomb threat at First Christian Church in Edmond. Now, for any parents that have children that are at that daycare center in Edmond, those children can be picked up at the Edmond Public Library right now. That is at uh, in about 10th and South Boulevard in Edmond. Again, a bomb threat at First Christian Church in Edmond. We also have a report from uh, Remington Park. They will not be open today, obviously because of the disaster and uh, you can see it's working on some other stuff right now and right now we're going to go ahead and pitch right back up to the desk back to you Devin and Kevin. Well the person who signed the note dementia may not have had anything really happening at uh, First Christian Church but clearly some kind of dementia is at work in yes. downtown Oklahoma City today at the Alfred Murrah Federal Building where an explosion occurred at about nine o'clock this morning and did the damage that you see there on your screen. The concern right now however is for two more uh, explosive devices which have been found on the east side of the federal building so as they were just moving in to be able to start evacuating people we saw the gentleman who was being uh, led down the fire ladder just as they were being able to really get into the full swing of the evacuation rescue efforts they have had to move back again and try and secure these other explosive devices which they've found and as Devin said uh, when the shock and fright begins to wear off the anger sets in about what is happening in our community and we're also getting word that another medical center has been set up at 10th and Robinson. Another medical center at 10th and Robinson to help treat the wounded from the blast. Now, how can you help? Well, you can give blood. There's a couple of places you can do that at. In Edmond, you can give blood at the Hobby Lobby. That's at 3434 South Boulevard. There you see the Red Cross hotline. Volunteer, volunteer your help. That number there, 232-7121. You can also give blood 
at the Blood Institute. That is at 10th and Lincoln, just south of Presbyterian Hospital. Do not go to the hospitals. They are swamped right now. So if you'd like to give blood that is badly needed at the disaster site treating these patients, you can do that at the Hobby Lobby in Edmond or at the Oklahoma Blood Institute at 10th and Lincoln. Also, feed the children working on something, Devin. If you are a restaurant owner, manager, restaurateur, and would like to help uh, feed some of the many people who are going to be downtown, uh, workers, victims, so on, uh, Feed the Children is putting together a collection of restaurant food uh, and donations that they will then uh, take downtown and help deliver. The phone number, for if you uh, are uh, an owner of a, or manager of a restaurant would like to help, the phone number at Feed the Children for that project is 942-0228, 942 -0228. To, to eight. We're now looking at a live picture from Baptist Medical Center. We had been told earlier by Teresa Green that some 25 patients had been brought there, but that was uh, about a half an hour ago. I would uh, well assume that the, uh, uh, the total has gone higher than that. Uh, on a much smaller scale, there are several other things that you can do to help. We are still being asked to tell you to stay off of cellular phones, and in fact, unless it is absolutely necessary, stay off of your home phone as well because the lines are just jammed. We're also getting word now that a triage center has been set up at the Marion, the large complex in downtown Oklahoma City. Of course, we've all grown up on MASH. We know what triage centers are. It's a place where they prep people to get ready for medical treatment. They are setting up a triage center at the Marion to handle the overflow of wounded coming from the federal building. I believe we've put together a map of the downtown evacuation area. This is the area that uh, right now they are uh, clearing people away from. Bordered on the north by 8th Street, down on the south by Main, uh, Walker to the west, and Santa Fe to the east. Uh, all of those areas right now they are trying to evacuate. Uh, uh, still a lot of concerns for not only the Alfred Murrow building as we mentioned earlier, but we, as we were listening uh, to Dave Brinkley who was a, a Baptist minister and an eyewitness who was speaking to us just a few moments ago, they're concerned about as far away as the Anthony's building, whether or not there's any structural damage there, the structural integrity remaining intact on so many of those buildings downtown. Uh, chances are if you were anywhere uh, within, I would say, uh, well, Kevin, you and I live, what, about 15 miles to 10 miles away from uh, downtown, each of us, and uh, we certainly, <laughs> there was no uh, guessing whether or not we felt an explosion this morning from our locale, so it's hard to say exactly how far the danger area was when this blast uh, first occurred at 9 o'clock, but we know that windows were shattered uh, about four blocks away, and uh, there you can see right now what I guess you would call very close to ground zero. You can see the absolute decimation of, of structures and windows and uh, automobiles that uh, the took place there right close to the scene. And as you, you said it beautifully earlier, Dev, and you're not looking at international destruction, folks. This is in our community. It looks like some kind of car bombing in Beirut or Bosnia, but this is in our hometown. And now you're looking at some of the panic that set in when the explosion happened and when the second bomb was located. This is, uh, we are showing you unedited pictures. We apologize if occasionally uh, something uh, might offend you, uh, but the whole thing is rather offensive. But uh, we will occasionally be seeing shots of uh, bloody faces, uh, people who are hurt very badly. We will occasionally hear uh, unedited language as well. Uh, there's Anthony Foster, who was downtown as they started to get the word that those other explosive devices had been found. And you can see that everybody started to... Uh, uh, have to evacuate and move away even quicker. Also talking about Tinker Air Force Base, they're taking 100% precaution right now because it is a major military installation, as we all know. They have also responded with a medical emergency team, fire and rescue units to the disaster area to do what they can to help out. Okay. I understand. We, understand. we were being told just now that uh, they're also taking some children to Veterans Hospital. So just about every medical outlet anywhere close to uh, to Oklahoma City, to the downtown area of Oklahoma City, is being called into service here. And that was one other thing that I guess we should mention again for those uh, who might be wanting to help. Uh, a call went out from St. Anthony's Hospital earlier for anybody who is uh, a qualified medical uh, technician, anybody who is qualified uh, to help with emergency medical care, they could use your help at St. Anthony's. You are watching live coverage from KFOR television in Oklahoma City. They are covering the massive explosion that uh, whipped away the entire front of the federal building, has caused uh, devastation. They've uh, evacuated 32 square blocks. There uh, are fatalities confirmed, but we do not know how many. We don't know where, and this is live coverage, and we're going to let you listen into that now. I got a daughter who works down here. She's a federal parole officer. 
Do you have a daughter in that that might be there? Yeah, I haven't heard nothing from them. I, I, I just got down here and trying to find out if they, they're running. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, Anthony Foster we saw just a moment ago who had been interviewing people there just as uh, word came down that yet another explosion was coming. There you see a woman who was very badly hurt obviously in the face. It gives you an idea of the fear and the panic that is setting in understandably so after the first major explosion and then word of possibly another one. Let's go now to Kent Hogel who is at Children's Hospital. Kent, what can you tell us from there? Ken, I'm on, I'm talking into the phone. I don't hear anybody. Ken, can you hear me? Can hear me in C control? We can hear you, Ken. If you can hear us, go ahead. Anybody? Ken cannot hear us right now. Um, having some phone problems. We'll be getting back to him in just a minute at Children's Hospital. That is where a number of children were taken for treatment. And, of course, that is the, the horror right now. Over file cabinets, over pieces of your desk, desks, office furniture, and then water was about that deep in the floor and the sprinklers coming on. It's just one big explosion or a couple or just one big boom? It sounded like just one big boom. Really loud. Then there was so much noise from everything falling in though you couldn't hear anything else. So you had no idea you might have the ceiling coming out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what happened, but it was just loud. You can see the cuts and abrasions on her face, and I, I believe when it's all said and done, we will uh, see that most of the injuries were from flying glass. We saw you. So two children were assuming from that daycare center, from that area, uninjured, a boy and a girl, and they are lost. They're at Memorial Hospital 921 Northeast 13th is where they were taken. Lee Hunter, if you want to, uh, this is the individual to contact, VA police and security, and I have a number. VA police and security, 270-5173. That's 270-5173, two children from this explosion, a boy and a girl under the age of one year, 12 months or younger, and they are uninjured. Cynthia Kelly, Jennifer. You know, one thing we should probably point out to you, uh, to those of you watching this video, because of the nature of flying glass at the building, a lot of these injuries will turn out to look worse than they are because the facial injuries bleed a lot. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of facial injury, a lot of bleeding, and uh, some of these people will perhaps look a little worse than they are, and uh, they'll be quickly cleaned up and treated, and probably, hopefully, the, not so many of the injuries will be as life-threatening as they may appear from our video. Well, and it's certainly a possibility that some of those injuries are coming from surrounding buildings because many windows were blown out. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's an incredible sight to behold, frankly. Um, you know, the patients being unloaded and just the, the trauma of their, their injuries. It's, it's a really sad thing. I did want to say about the explosion. Uh, Nine o'clock this morning, there was apparently a bomb. Is uh, the world, uh, that's the theory that the federal investigators are working on. All right, and you can see here, this uh, this is a Mercy Ambulance unit that probably came from the uh, Bethlehem. You are looking at video from KWTV in Oklahoma City. We're going, right now we have Clayton Taylor of the Red Cross in Oklahoma City on the telephone. Good morning, Mr. Taylor. Good morning. Uh, what can you tell us about what is happening right now with your rescue efforts, with, uh, with what's uh, going on in trying to help these people? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the city of Oklahoma City has certainly joined together and everybody is just doing everything they can to volunteer their services. Uh, from the Red Cross here, we already have on the scene downtown uh, about 200 uh, 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 people that are trained in, in medical care uh, that are providing first aid and, and any medical assistance they can at the scene. Uh, they're com comforting the non-injured uh, and administering to there are a number of shock victims down there. And, and what we're trying to do is administer food and drink and blankets and that sort of thing until these people can be transported. They're transporting the more, more seriously injured first. Uh, we have another uh, hundreds of volunteers who have shown up here at the Red Cross, which really is as many as we can handle right now. Uh, but uh, the, just down the street from us here is the, uh, is the blood bank, and people are lined up down the street. Uh, it looks like hundreds and hundreds of people volunteering to give their blood. 
uh, the, the city has really come together very quickly to, to help in this uh, disaster. Uh, Mr. Taylor, we were listening, we've been listening to the live coverage from the television stations there, and one of the points that was just made is that uh, because of flying glass, there are many facial injuries that probably will not turn out to be uh, devastatingly serious, but I mean, it looks like there are some very, very seriously injured people. Do you have any estimate of how many people you're treating right now? No, we don't have any estimate. There are a number of uh, hospitals located uh, in, in the north area of the city, uh, approximate to downtown, and uh, victims are being taken to a number of these different hospitals. We really don't have any information like that at this time. It's, it's much too early uh, to be speculating on anything like that. So what we're doing is we're, we're getting the volunteers organized. We've got the people down at the scene. Uh, we're asking for folks who, uh, who have uh, items that they can start volunteering and, and uh, and donating, and we're uh, asking people to come and donate blood at the Blood Institute. So uh, these are the sort of things we're doing right now. Uh, the information coming back is very sketchy right now. Uh, a lot of what we know is really what we've seen on TV coverage. Uh, Mr. Taylor, we know that uh, in the event times when we've had disasters here in Southern California, we've had help from uh, all around the country. People have uh, offered services. Is there anything that uh, Southern Californians can do to help out in any way? I think we're going to need that later on. Uh, right now, we're trying to first take care of the victims. Uh, there's, uh, as I understand, uh, fairly widespread damage in the north part of downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, I don't know what we'll have to do eventually. We're taking uh, calls here at the at the Red Cross for volunteers who will be able to to help in uh, in in uh, removing uh, uh, damaged uh, uh, things and 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 in the in the reconstruction of the buildings and all of that. I mean the the kinds of calls we're getting here is everything from I've got blankets to give to I want to give blood to I want to know where where my uh, husband might be and we're taking all that information down and then and then we'll uh, get back to these people just as quick as we can. Right now we're just really uh, making sure that we're taking care of the people who have been injured. Well, uh, this is uh, absolutely devastating and certainly uh, all of us here in Southern California. Uh, I mean, we, we've had disasters, but certainly this is, is just unbelievable. I'm watching the pictures, and I'm not really quite sure what to say. And uh, everyone, anyone in Southern California who might want to give any kind of help should call their local Red Cross, I would imagine, and see if there's any, any kind of uh, yes. reciprocal agreement, if they want to donate blood, something like that. I suppose that that possibility exists. And I'm, I'm also sure that uh, Red Cross chapters throughout California will be helping us, as they will all around the country. So that would be a place that people could go uh, to, to give uh, uh, you know, goods or services or whatever. Um, I, was, I am a volunteer here at the Red Cross. And, and I was at another location, and, and the, the way the people in this city have all pulled together and, and, uh, and met in prayer, and, and uh, I mean, it, it, it's incredible. It's, uh, the streets are jammed with people trying to be helpful. Uh, and so we're doing all that we can to, to first take care of those victims, and then uh, this city will regroup and figure out what our next step is. Well, certainly here in Southern California, we are no strangers to disaster, and uh, we've received a lot of help from other cities around the United States, and I am sure that uh, the people here in Southern California will do everything they can to help you. We're going to let you get back to your work now. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank and, you. Uh, and thanks for your concern and, and your thoughts and prayers there in Southern California. We'll, we're going to need all of them. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank uh, you, Taylor. So we are now watching a videotape of pictures. Okay. okay we now have uh, Governor Frank well, Keating, uh, Oklahoma Governor. Well, let's listen I, uh, to that. Uh, I, as most Oklahomans, can't imagine that something this brutal and callous and vicious could occur uh, here in Oklahoma City, but it has. <clears throat> I understand from, from uh, news reports that they found uh, uh, an explosive device and deactivated it. Maybe there's another one. But uh, this is a brutal, vicious act, and uh, I expect uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and the FBI to provide us their national response teams to assist the local authorities investigating and identifying who's responsible in finding them. Uh, Governor Kevin Ogle with you. Has the FBI told you anything? Did they call you and alert you? Have they told you anything, give you any inkling about what may have happened? No, they didn't, and uh, that's no great surprise. Obviously, uh, I'm scrambling to provide the state response. They're scrambling to provide the federal response. Uh, Governor Branstead of Iowa, for example, called a few minutes ago to, saying that he wanted to provide whatever medical assistance he could. The White House has asked what we need, and of course what we're anxious to do now, and I'm on my way to the Civil Defense Office where our command post uh, will be, is to make sure that the state does everything it possibly can to help the victims, 
uh, this terrible tragedy. And I, uh, this morning, asked the staff to uh, say a prayer together for those people who were injured and for those people who unfortunately didn't make it. It's just a terrible, terrible thing. It sure is. Was there ever any concern about your safety, about the heads of state in Oklahoma? Was anything ever conveyed to you like that? No, no. And I, as far as I know, uh, nobody had an inkling that this uh, could have occurred or would occur. Uh, I think it's important to be to be safe and uh, let uh, uh, public employees uh, who may be victimized to go on home for the rest of the day. And but we need those who are, of course, essential public security and, and medical people to stay at their posts. And Governor, just one more question. We know you've got a lot to do. We'll let you get on your way. But you uh, released a statement earlier that there was a considerable loss of life. Have you got any specifics on the scale of what we're talking about yet? No, I don't. I just had the report from people from law enforcement who are coming from downtown and that is their report uh, obviously one loss of life is considerable and, and, and unnecessary and there have been several and I don't know how many but obviously we'll find out soon what's important obviously is to see how many people we can save all right governor Keating thank you so much for your thank time you. we will be talking with you again I'm sure as the day continues and goes on right now we need to go to Yuzi Brown Washington who is in downtown Oklahoma City for an update from Yuzi go ahead Kevin and Devin we're standing on a rooftop about six blocks away from where the Okay, we have also just received a report that uh, police have evacuated the uh, Boston Federal Building. Apparently, workers with the uh, employees of the IRS, with the Internal Revenue Service, reported areas of their offices appeared to have been tampered with when they arrived at work this morning. An, office with, an, off, an official with the General Services Administration says that uh, the workers found that their work area was not secure. For instance, they found that doors and other things that should have been locked were uh, unlocked and in some cases open. This is in Boston, Massachusetts, and they have decided that uh, they don't know if it means anything. There is, uh, there's not a bomb threat there in Boston, but the officials say in light of this devastating tragedy in Oklahoma City, the bombing in Oklahoma City that ripped away the entire front of the federal building, they have decided to be cautious and order an evacuation of the federal building in Boston. Uh, this uh, clearly is uh, having implications uh, throughout the United States. Uh, there is a great deal of concern. This is uh, a massive explosion. What you are looking at is unedited videotape, as you can see on your screen from KFOR television in Oklahoma City. We have been seeing pictures of this all morning. Uh, we have had reports. They are simply shooting this videotape and uh, turning it around live, uh, turning it around uh, unedited. And we have, uh, you can see that there is uh, this person right here who has been evacuated. Okay. Tell me about the injured that you had to leave behind. What were they saying? What were they doing? They didn't want us to leave. We had to leave them. That was a difficult thing to do. They're there to save lives, but they had to walk away because they thought more bombs were in there. Oh, you could see the tears in his eyes. He, he was speechless. After I kept asking those questions, he had to just stop, pause, and he could say no more. And I think that speaks a thousand words for the devastation what's going on in that building we also i was witnessing them pulling people out from underneath that rubble we had unconfirmed reports at the time that we heard on the scanners and let me reiterate this is unconfirmed that a water line pipeline in the bottom of the federal building had burst and that there was flooding and people were screaming we're trapped we want out we don't know at this point if that's true it's unconfirmed reports and we're also watching the rescue efforts which were about an hour and a half ago they're very slow very steady most of the victims coming out, going down that ramp, were able to walk. A lot of them afterwards were placed on gurneys, and it was just devastating to see the expression on these EMSA workers' faces. They're unable to estimate how many people inside there may not have survived. We're also hearing reports from witnesses inside that building. They survived because they would dive under desks, but those that didn't think fast enough or couldn't get to shelter fast enough, it's unfortunate. We have an untold number of victims at this time, and there's unconfirmed reports. Everybody shrugging their shoulders, asking, is this really America? Is this really happening in the heart of Oklahoma City, a devastating place? As we were coming in earlier, about six blocks away, it was so surreal. It looked like a war zone. I felt like I was in video from the Middle East. We were running down the streets, and there were people walking around, day scratching their heads, saying, what has happened? And what was most devastating was to see people bleeding. Actually, see the extent of these injuries you would see people in car wrecks from so many stories that would cover the devastating injuries but nobody was able to care for them they had to sit there and wait and just have their loved ones and their co-workers around to comfort them they were in shock but these emergency workers trying the best that they can were unable to reach all those
those that were in desperate need of help. Again, and, and we got the same impression when we drove in. Uh, as far as three blocks over, five blocks over, west of here, you can see uh, buildings where windows are blown out. Uh, people are in, over there make, makeshift now, putting in things, trying to secure their buildings. Uh, again, hundreds of people milling around down here. Uh, they don't know what to do. Some of them, as Jana mentioned, are just in shock. They don't know whether to go home. They don't know. They just can't absorb what happened here. Again, Steve, go in tight on that building. Again, we want to show you what remains downtown. Basically, you see a lot of people down there. Those are emergency crews. There are still people in some of those buildings. They're going through the rubble. As Jana mentioned, when she talked to that emergency official, they had to leave people. They thought there were two other devices in there. They moved the media. They moved emergency people. Everyone had to clear. And that sounds like a heartless thing, but considering the damage that this one bomb did, they could not take the risk of having two or three more go off and not know how many other people could be injured. You see, you were mentioning the damage. We have fire captains and fire officials running down the streets trying to warn people these buildings are unsafe. The percussion and the force of that blast has blown these walls out, but they're shaky. And at this point, if a girl under the age of one year, they are not injured. We're also getting word if you have a generator, they could use it at Northeast 6th and Lincoln. Uh, let me see, let me pass one more thing along. If you're downtown watching this and you've been involved in this mess, there is food at the Myriad Arena, food available at the Myriad Arena at this hour downtown. Guys, we'll get back with you if you have anything else. Okay, Tammy, thank you very much. Uh, we want to go uh, down to the scene downtown Oklahoma City right now to Newsline 9 Scan Matthew Scan. Uh, this is Gan Matthews. I'm uh, in downtown Oklahoma City, about uh, six, seven blocks uh, removed from the bomb site. Uh, joining me uh, right now is Mindy Kepfield. Mindy is a reporter with the Journal Record. And Mindy, you were inside the Journal Record building uh, when this happened. Yes. Tell us what you saw and heard and experienced. Well, I was just in the office and the walls moved in toward us and I was thrown on my back and then debris from the ceiling started raining down on me and I had to kick my way out to get to the exit. There was smoke and there was debris raining down from the top, just raining, falling down. There are, how many other employees are in your office? In my office, about six or seven employees. They all got out fine, except for a couple of them were kind of cut up pretty bad. No serious injuries? Did you no care? serious, but our boss was got a cut on his head, pretty good laceration from glass. And you, you have a slight cut here too, I see. Yeah, but apart from that, uh, the damage is to you is mainly, mainly uh, to the psyche? Well, it was just a shock because we didn't know what was happening. We heard a big boom and then all of a sudden it was so loud that we thought our building was the one that was exploding. Okay. What happened to the, to the windows around you? I didn't see. There was so much thick black smoke that I couldn't even see. Okay. I just ran to the exit. Okay. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with downtown Oklahoma City, where does the, the Journal Record building sit in relation to the Murrah building? It's just right across. It's just right. I think it's right north of it. It's just right across from the building, directly catty corner. Okay. What, you know, what floor were you on and what difficulty did you have uh, exiting the building? I was on the first floor and I just had to run or tried, had to dodge debris as I was running the exit. All the windows were blown out. Okay. Mindy Kepfield, well, thank you for having to go back in and start uh, trying to track down the people who are still trapped. I also want to continue to warn you about this video that we're getting back from the scene. Of course, it is raw, unedited video. Some of it is very graphic, as you have seen. These are your friends and neighbors, our friends and neighbors who are hurt and bloodied by this explosion and medical personnel doing all they can to help them at this point. But be aware of what we're watching here today, a major disaster of international proportion. In Oklahoma City, and some of this video. I'm Marta Waller here. You are watching uh, videotape and, in some cases, live pictures from two different television stations in Oklahoma City. The explosion of the uh, at the Federal Building in that city has uh, injured scores of people. Uh, there are fatalities. We don't know how many at this time. One uh, piece of information: we know that at least 514 people work in the uh, federal building, the AP Murrah building in Oklahoma City, and it houses agencies, the Social Security Administration, the General Accounting Office, 
uh, the Small Business Administration, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, the U.S. Air Force, Department of Agriculture, Customs, the Secret Service, the Veterans Administration. It is a federal building with all the federal offices in it. We uh, know at this time that the explosion, which happened uh, around 9 o'clock this morning, Oklahoma City time, could be felt for could be felt for 50 miles uh, for 50 miles around. People thought uh, some people knew it was an explosion because it was very very close. Others. Uh, wondered if perhaps it was an earthquake because they were on streets and bridges and they felt the ground move very very hard and we can listen in now and i said immediately um i said i that's an explosion i said something just blew up and uh i had served in the ground defensive operations in iraq during the gulf war and uh, i've heard explosions before and there was no mistake in my mind as to what had happened um, it was a, a very quick response time after that about five minutes uh, and there were emergency uh, vehicles we're standing about six blocks away now from the impact site let's go in tight so you can see exactly what we're able to see this is as close as we're allowed that's because when we were down closer about an hour ago they found a second device. They were afraid that there may even have been a third device. They cleared everyone out for a four-block area. Emergency officials say that they were trying to still get people out of the rubble of that building that you see devastated right there, and they were even told to leave the area. They heard people screaming for help. Please get us out of here. People were seriously injured, but because of the threat of a second or possibly third bomb, everyone was pushed out of the area at this point officials have gone in they're trying to get rid of those devices this is devastation for oklahoma it doesn't even look like america anymore people are walking around in shock we do not know the totals of people injured they're having a hard time why to comprehend, but there are two children at University Hospital, uh, and they have not been able to identify their parent or figure out who their parents are. So if you are by chance watching this program, knowing that you've had a young child uh, down at the hospital and have not yet been able to locate them, uh, try calling University Hospital, and uh, who knows how many more times that same scenario we've played out today. And you know, it seems the worst of times always brings out the best of people, and you can see it in a downtown where friends and neighbors helping those they don't even know but they know they need help so they're getting them to the medical treatment they need to survive this explosion at the federal building one like we said earlier of international proportion there you see it from as Devin said earlier ground zero where it happened and it's just a smoldering mess right now you know Kevin we mentioned that we are two years removed to the day uh, from the disaster at the uh, Branch Davidian Complex in Waco, Texas. We are also not too far away from the two-year anniversary of the explosion at the World Trade Center in New York. Uh, that would have been, uh, the two-year an marking anniversary of that would have been this past February. I was there that day, and the um, similarities are eerie. You can't help but... EMTs, Weapons, we have the latest information now. Set up to be is for critical care. How many patients do you think are coming here in critical care? I have no idea. I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. This is all set up for critical patients. As you can see, just people here waiting. Uh, we understand there is an ambulance there, but I don't believe there's any patients uh, in that ambulance right now. But we'll keep checking back. Cindy, what else is going on? Okay, for over here in this area, what we've got now are for people with intermediate injuries. And what we're going to do with them is treat them as best as we can and then get them ready to go to prepare them for transport. We also have physicians, EMTs, paramedics, nurses, med techs, everyone over in this area. We've got utility crews in here working to get us some lights. We've got generators coming in. We have all types of resources. So right now what I can say is for people to stay out of this area that we are, we are completely full. We've got enough supplies and bandages. Just right now, just kind of let us do our We want to remind our viewers once again that you are seeing video from two different television stations in Oklahoma City, KWT. TV and KFOR TV, what you're seeing now is KWTV. This is a triage center that has been set up for injured, uh, for victims of this explosion. And there is, uh, as you just heard the reporter saying, an area for intermediate care and for critical care. But uh, we are getting video from two separate television stations. Uh, and uh, this tape, the pictures that we are seeing are unedited. And they expect to see some of the injured being brought into these uh, 
uh, areas that have been set up as uh, emergency hospitals, if you will, to, uh, to uh, sort out the injuries before they take uh, people to the hospitals. Let's listen to what we're hearing right now. So far, the truck is still at the federal building. We don't know the status of, of them, whether or not they've been able to get to it or not yet. Still watching to see if they come out with that truck. Also joining us is Heidi Browning, who's made her way over here from uh, closer to the building. What have you seen on your way over? Well, I spent about an hour and a half in front of the federal building, right at the corner where they had set up the original triage unit. And people were coming out in a very steady stream, very injured. Uh, we saw some children that were brought out. Uh, we understand that the daycare center, the nursery on the north side of the building, was one of the worst that was injured. There were police officers in there working to try to dig some of these children out. I saw detectives who have 15 years experience who said they had never seen anything like it. They were in tears at what they had seen inside the nursery. We also had to run when they found the second bomb. They they moved us all back and there was a panic and people were just running for blocks. We had to go back about eight blocks and we have just now been able to make our way back here uh, from that. I think they're starting to bring in some more people. This is where they've set up another triage unit, as you know, after having to back up from that original location. Uh, we'll just step back behind this yellow tape, as they've asked us to do. Uh, if we can just keep our cameras on these ambulances. Uh, I've seen about four just coming through here in the last moment. Uh, one's pulling up here right now. Uh, we don't know if there are people inside there or not, but let's just uh, stay here. Uh, on these pictures, we'll stay here live at the One same other thing that uh, we would like to, uh, to point out, now. there is a Quick. daycare center Robin. for employees, Robin. and that daycare center is in the okay. building, and that, that's the nursery. Okay. And we there were some very, very small in children in there, there and uh, the uh, parents, parents are clearly what trying to find their children. They're having trouble linking up some children with their parents and determining uh, whose children were in the daycare center and if their parents were in the building. But there is a daycare center in the federal building. It is for the employees of that building. Let's uh, listen in again. ...to bring people out at the time that we all had to run, that we had to back up. And so they cleared the building so that the bomb technicians, about every bomb technician from the county apparently has gone into the building to look for these devices. And so they've had to um, stop what they were doing, stop the efforts to find victims, and I don't know yet if it's clear if they are now going back in to find people. We may get a whole nother wave right. once they're able to go back in. So right now they, they had to pause on their rescue efforts for a moment to concentrate on the explosives, uh, and then, so there's a possibility that we'll see a lot more injured people coming out as they're able to get uh, through the building and get them out of there. Is that, were we understanding that correctly? Yes, yes, and uh, again, um, the north side of the building is it's basically gone, Jennifer. Um, the nursery, the second floor of the building caved in on top of the nursery. They were having to dig to find victims. And so uh, talking to people who have made their way out, some of the rescue officials and people that were inside, they are just in shock at what they have seen in there. And I'm afraid we will see many, many more victims that are coming out of that building as they're able to get in there and continue to look for them. So even the seasoned veterans that uh, we saw from our video very touched by what they'd seen inside and the tragedy of it. All right, Heidi, Robin, Dave, thank you. Uh, and we'll leave them at the scene to monitor what's going on there. But uh, we have some uh, other information on how this is affecting uh, the rest of the country and uh, Jim Stewart of CBS standing by with that. Got Jim. 60 adults have been brought in. There, you're looking at video now that uh, we just brought back here. All right, here be to the careful. If you, let's just warn them now, Cynthia, that this is raw tape that we shot at the hospital, and, and we have not censored this in any way, so we may see some graphic stuff. Yeah, they're pretty much the victims have uh, broken bones, uh, cuts and bruises and burns. Uh, 60 adults are being taken. What you are seeing right now is uh, videotape that was shot uh, earlier today, shortly after the explosion, uh, victims being brought to the hospital. and. As we are reminding our viewers, uh, as they are also reminding viewers in Oklahoma City, this is unedited videotape, so some of the uh, pictures are particularly startling, certainly very graphic and, and very shocking. There are very, very serious injuries as well as fatalities, and the fire officials in Oklahoma City say people are still trapped in that federal building. As we reported a little earlier, everyone was cleared from the area when a second bomb was found because uh, officials bomb squad, fire department, were very, very concerned that that 
a second device would explode and they had to get people out of the areas. From in this and picture you can see the kind of damage that was done. Just a huge chunk of the building uh, just wow. almost completely wow. bitten out is the way it looks. This is a live picture you're seeing now from Chopper 4. One other piece of news to pass along. Attorney General Janet Reno has dispatched a special FBI envoy to Oklahoma City to investigate. You start to get an idea of the national and international sweep of this story. The uh, lead story all over the world right now is datelined Oklahoma City and this story is having repercussions in cities elsewhere for instance uh, bomb threats have been called in uh, they had to evacuate the federal building in Boston Massachusetts uh, which apparently they believe would have had uh, some link someone trying to capitalize on the disaster that has visited us here but that is part of uh, if this is our introduction into the politics of international terror uh, well, then we're going to uh, learn much more about how this game is played a little bit with uh, these bizarre uh, claims of responsibility that are called in. People trying to call in bomb threats elsewhere. It's just a just an awful, awful game. Well, that's Once again, we are seeing aerials from KFOR television. This is the federal building where the bomb exploded. And as you can see, it isn't just the front of the building. It is torn fully a third of the way, maybe even halfway through that building. Uh, just a, a device of... Uh, enormous proportions to have done that kind of to have done that kind of damage and of course there are windows blown out uh, uh, in a very very wide area surrounding this building but uh, you can see that uh, the helicopter uh, camera is zooming in on that building right now and it is just uh, there's literally nothing left of the front of that building and it has gone it's not as I said it isn't just the front it's gone halfway through the building and literally collapsed the whole north side of the building. Uh, I, we understand that uh, faces north, and of course the daycare center, the second floor of the building collapsed on the daycare center. There are parents, uh, absolutely frantic parents, trying to locate their children. Rescue officials are, we have heard, digging those, those little ones out of the debris, and uh, they, some have been taken to the hospital. A couple have been taken with no injuries and they have not yet figured out whose parents these children are. They're particularly uh, little. They're very, very small children. But uh, the entire surrounding area was, ev was evacuated. And at one point this morning when they found the second bomb and they took the rescue workers out, people literally trampled one another running away from that building and from the area because clearly if the first bomb did this kind of damage, there was great concern that a second bomb could completely could level the building and uh, but you can see from the air uh, they've come around the south side of it now and you can see that uh, a whole chunk was literally taken out of the top of the building and it went all the way to the ground absolutely devastating let's go back and listen to their live coverage in Oklahoma City well more than hundreds of injuries now all of the area hospitals a full eight Oklahoma City area hospitals are now involved St. Anthony's is full Presbyterian is probably wow. nearing that point we, they were one of the first involved uh, and there you can just see what a horrific scene just the, the full force of this that was blown uh, blown outward from the building Dan Threlkeld earlier compared it a little bit to the way that a tornado works with the way that the right. air implodes right. and then, uh, blows outwards well you can see just the devastation downtown and as Devin said we all felt it in Oklahoma City, so we're all part of what happened. I'm sure wherever you are in the Oklahoma City area, you heard and felt something and wondered what in the world was it. Well, that was it. So we're all part of the story that's taking on international proportion right now. And it's just devastating that it's happened anywhere, but especially in our backyard here in America's heartland, where you, that's the last place you would expect something like this to happen, but it has happened. But I'll tell you, Oklahomans in the Oklahoma City area responding already, Devin mentioned about folks showing up to give blood. They're already turning people away because so many people have volunteered to help going down to give blood, helping out with the Red Cross, doing whatever they can to help their friends and neighbors who are in need. And again, the most horrible aspect of this is that the children that were involved, the daycare inside the building, we don't know how badly the children were hurt who were there, but we know that they're being treated right now. An 18-month-old has burns over 55 percent of its body and other kids seriously hurt right now and as we sit here and wonder how in the world this could happen in oklahoma city uh take into consideration the comments of dr neil livingston who is a terrorist expert who recently spoke in oklahoma city about terrorism 
and is today saying that it comes as no surprise to him that Oklahoma City would one, ba one day be targeted by terrorists, if, the, if you want to believe that that is uh, what this is, and we have confirmed that it was indeed a bombing of some variety. Uh, but Dr. Livingston says uh, there's a couple of reasons that make Oklahoma uh, a desirable target if you are so inclined. Number one, its central location, and number two, its oil industry. Uh, hitting the federal building, obviously, also is, uh, would make sense if you were trying to catch the attention of a nation. And as we mentioned, uh, the federal building, we've told you about all of the different federal offices that it houses there. Uh, the federal government has been uh, on alert, not only for the uh, offices that are housed in that building, but all of the federal offices. Once again, you are looking at pictures, uh, live pictures from Oklahoma City of the federal building that uh, was bombed this morning. Our uh, reporter, Eric Spillman, is at the federal building in downtown Los Angeles, and uh, clearly this has had uh, major implications across the United States, the federal building in Boston was evacuated as a precautionary measure when uh, workers found things that were not quite right when they arrived at work this morning. Let's go now to uh, Eric Spillman in downtown Los Angeles and see what the situation is there and what the impact of this bombing has been down in Los Angeles. Good morning, Eric. Well, good morning, Marta. Actually, we're in Westwood, and if you've uh, driven by on Wilshire Boulevard, you've seen this uh, federal building so many times. It's 17 stories high, and it actually, I'm told, resembles uh, the federal building in Oklahoma City where they had the explosion and there are all kinds of of offices here uh, many many different federal agencies the Commerce Department this is where you go to get a passport the State Department and because of what happened in Oklahoma City they have made some changes here in the security they've definitely tightened up the security let's walk over here to the entrance first of all normally there are three entrances to this building that are open but this morning because of what happened in Oklahoma City only one entrance is open and that is what they are doing they're restricting access to the building as a result of what happened in Oklahoma City take a look in there you can see the uh, metal detector everyone has to go through a metal detector unless you have a, uh, a badge that identifies you as a federal employee and they have extra officers here now checking those badges. This gentleman here checks the badge uh, of people who are coming in uh, first and then if you look over there in the middle of the corridor there, there is an, uh, an FBI agent. That is not normally her job but what she does is rechecks those federal badges. They added her this morning to take a look at people as they came in again and check them again to make sure nobody's going inside the federal building who shouldn't be. And I'm told that uh, in addition to the increased security here, there is also increased security in downtown Los Angeles. There's a big federal courthouse, as you know, on Los Angeles Street downtown. They've also made some changes there as a result of what has happened uh, in Oklahoma City. So that is the latest from Westwood. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. And uh, if the, you have any more information later on, we will get back to you. We should uh, remind our viewers, of course, we have a federal building in downtown Los Angeles and the federal building in Westwood. Uh, reporter Eric Spillman reporting live from Westwood. Let's go back to the pictures now of Oklahoma City. Once again, we are looking at uh, live pictures from a helicopter at one of the two television stations, either uh, KWTV or KFOR. I'm not sure which one is providing the aerial coverage. And you can see it. it's just devastating the uh, the rubble across the street uh, and into the parking lot area across the street windows of course were shattered throughout the uh, city let's listen in now to their coverage building word that people are trapped inside there Jana Davis told us about that earlier but word that people are trapped inside the basement they're working their way to them at this point to get them out of there and to get them to medical attention that they need. The one thing that, we're, that we are getting a much better indication here looking at the aerial pictures, we heard the eyewitnesses earlier telling us about how it, it appeared as if all of the floors just dropped away from them and you can certainly get an idea now of what they were saying. Uh, we heard from a gentleman earlier who said that he was on the fifth floor and it appeared to him as if everything around him fell away. Uh, the only thing that was left still staying up on the fifth floor was the little portion of, of office space uh, on which he was standing. And you can certainly get an idea here. Uh, WKY Radio, I mentioned, or w, uh, KTOK earlier, I should say, uh, had an interview uh, with a gentleman who said that he actually, f uh, when the explosion occurred, free fell for five floors and somehow managed to survive it. But you can get an idea now, uh, now that we can get an aerial view of just how that occurred.
Right now, let's go to the News Channel's Tara Bloom. She is at the Myriad, where they have set up a makeshift triage center. Tara. Well, Kevin, right now here in the Myriad, they're just setting up long tables of food for anyone in the downtown area that needs help. Also, all the employees of the Federal Reserve Bank have been asked to come here, and they have all arrived, and they've been going through the list trying to account for all the Federal Reserve Bank employees. Right now, they think they have accounted for everybody. Right now, this is a major concern with all the buildings and all the damage, not just in the Federal Building, but surrounding buildings. They're trying to account for all the employees, and that's kind of what's going on here. And some people have been gathering. A lot of the people here have been saying they would like to donate blood, and they wish that they could get to a location where they could donate blood. But our understanding is that a lot of those areas are already jam-packed. Back to you. Thanks very much. Uh, add one more hospital to the list of those who have been helping out. Bethany Health Center now. Uh, over on the far western part of the city, 15 patients have been admitted there, waiting to be treated. Uh, so that would take us now up to nine area hospitals who have been called into service. 54 people have been taken out of Presbyterian Hospital. The injuries ranging from, uh, well, from very critical to minor. Uh, many glass-related, as we told you earlier, all of that glass exploding out of that building would be like uh, razor blades being shot out of a cannon. So Trump, we would certainly yeah. expect so many injuries uh, to be of that variety. Hospital spokesman at Presbyterian say that so far, everyone who's been admitted has been conscious. Unfortunately, we really don't know just how much uh, of the rescue effort uh, was able to be accomplished before they were called out of there on the, th on the threat and the fear that there were more explosive devices inside. So That's we right. don't know exactly how much of a chore is left now as the evacuation and rescue workers are finally able to get back in there. We are getting more word from the Highway Patrol. They are again requesting, please stay off your car phones, off your cell phones. The system is so jammed right now, they need those lines to make emergency calls. Please stay off your car phones and cell phones if you're going to be going out. Please stay off of those because of the tremendous overload right now. And if you're at home, they're even asking that you stay off your residential phones right now because those lines are so jammed. The patients yet, Jennifer, come here to the triage center. We're about four blocks down. And what our understanding is, uh, just south of here, there's just a line of ambulances. I don't know, uh, Chris, if you can just see that line of ambulances just waiting to head back down to the federal building. Uh, and some of those people will, uh, some of those people, tilt up just a little bit, babe, there you go. Uh, some of the people will actually be carried down to, uh, on stretchers from the federal court building, uh, brought here to this triage centers. Others will be transported from these ambulances. They'll have their initial care here and then sent on to the hospitals if needed. Okay. Robin, I just took another look too down the street. Uh, on 5th Street, trying to see what I could see as far as the federal courthouse. I saw a group of probably a hundred law enforcement type uh, folks gathered around. I think they're still all looking at the bomb truck, trying to figure out if it's doing any good. We do want to re repeat that this explosion occurred at a federal office building, which is just a block or just, actually just across, across the, street, the street north from the federal courthouse. It did not go off at the, at the courthouse itself, but the courthouse did receive some damage from the concussion and some broken windows and certainly some flying glass, as did many buildings downtown. And we have talked about the fact that the federal building, the federal courthouse building where the judges are in the courtrooms and all of that does have federal marshals and security, uh, metal detectors and that sort of thing, limited access, and this building does not. However, if, as we're being told now, this was a car bombing from out in the street, none of that would have made any difference. It could have just as easily been the federal courthouse. So it would appear, <coughs> excuse me, that there's something inside this particular building, one of these agencies that was being targeted. There had been talk about the fact that since this is the second anniversary of the explosion in Waco, that perhaps this had something to do with that. We have, and, and perhaps it does, but we have been told Ramsey Clark, attorney for the Branch Davidians, uh, which was the uh, religious group involved in that uh, uh, tragedy in Waco. Ramsey Clark, their attorney, has told Newsline 9 uh, just in the last hour his group is not claiming responsibility for that and was not involved. That is the word that we are getting from the Branch Davidian attorney. Let's go to Newsline 9's Heidi Browning right now in downtown Oklahoma City. Heidi? Kelly, we're getting ready to show some video uh, that we got when we were down right at ground zero earlier this morning before we had to back up. Let's go to some tape. This is the original triage unit that was set up right directly in front of the federal building. It was a scene that I, I just can't not even describe to you. It, it was horrible. They brought in, uh, they had ambulances coming in from everywhere. There were people that were just volunteers running into the building, and then as more and more emergency officials came, 
they rushed into the building bringing out people with very serious injuries and some children who were very seriously injured as we've been telling you the daycare center was destroyed the second floor of the building collapsed on top of the nursery and so there were many children that were brought out um, and the police officers who rescued them said that the injuries were horrific that shrapnel was just blown th all through the rooms and they were caved in upon there were a also a lot of walking wounded people who were coming from um, upstairs their co-workers were helping them down and they were there were people there who had begun the triage unit there were a lot of people sitting around just in a daze uh, there you can see one of the police officers who had volunteered and rushed in to try to save some of the children um, he is a 15-year veteran and he told me that he has never seen anything like this it's more than just emotional down here people are devastated by what they're seeing everyone keeps saying i can't believe this is happening in oklahoma city um, again the uh, uh, right before we had to back up because of the threat of another bomb th there were a lot more ambulance units on the scene and they were starting to call for more sophisticated life-saving equipment and at that time is when uh, the, the panic occurred and we all had to back up and, and run. Jennifer? The, the, the little, the, it looked, appeared to be a little boy, you know, probably a toddler that uh, Don Hole of the Oklahoma City Police Department was holding there. Are there, were there others that you saw that were injured? Did, do we have any idea if the majority of the kids in the center survived or? I, I do, do know, know I do know this that one officer that you're talking about he told me he saw himself three children okay Martin Waller here you're watching uh, pictures of, from Oklahoma City KWTV right now this video was recorded earlier injured people being brought into triage centers we've also just received word that the federal building in downtown Wilmington Delaware has been evacuated a sergeant in that city says police will search the building for a bomb as a precaution in light of the explosion at a federal building in Oklahoma City however sergeant Dunning will not confirm whether Wilmington police had a bomb threat uh, they are simply evacuating the building as a precaution and as we saw here in Los Angeles security has been tightened at the federal building in Westwood also in downtown Los Angeles and at the federal courthouse in downtown Los Angeles this uh, bombing in Oklahoma City took place this morning at 9 a.m. federal workers the federal employees generally go to work between 8 and 9 in the morning there were many children in the daycare center which is provided for the employees of the uh, ve various federal agencies in that building. That daycare center is on the first floor. The second floor collapsed on it, and they have been digging through the rubble to get to those children. We understand there are also people still trapped, adults still trapped in the federal building. Rescue workers, of course, were rushed out of the area when firefighters discovered a second bomb clearly the devastation uh, caused by the first bomb meant that they were going to take absolutely no chances and it is our understanding that rescue workers were just devastated when they were ordered to leave the area because they know there are people in there of course they're back there now beginning to get people out of the out of the building this uh, is unedited videotape and the television stations in Oklahoma City are turning it around as quickly as they can so uh, uh, that's why we see some rewinding and some some pictures that are not quite uh, quite as clear and we understand CNN CNN is now reporting that a car bomb was in front of this federal building and uh, we don't have immediate confirmation of that but CNN is reporting a car bomb and you can see what we're looking at now is the south side of the federal building and you can see that uh, all the windows are out in this building it just blew right straight through the building and it just took like a gigantic bite out of uh, the whole north side of the building half of it is gone it's it has gone a third of the way through uh, almost the entire building and, and almost two-thirds if you look at this end of it right here and all the windows have been blown out and uh, let's listen in now tell you about this there's a big board in there that has a list a name of everyone who has been injured in this catast catastrophe it has what hospital that person is at and if possible has the condition of that person 
I think. The major explosion occurred outside the building, in front of the building. Okay, and uh, once again, we're going from, uh, we're seeing unedited videotape and it's being switched around. Uh, we are getting different pictures and different reporters from moment to moment. But if you look at this, you can see this is the the south side of the federal building. We're seeing a helicopter picture. It, they're having a little bit of transmission trouble, but if, if we stick with this picture for a minute, you'll see that uh, all that's left standing is that one outside wall. And uh, they're having a little bit of difficulty with that picture, and we'll... Now we have more... Okay, we have uh, new pictures now. This is KFOR television. And we can see people being taken from ambulances. They're taking many of these people to makeshift uh, triage centers where they can determine the seriousness of the injuries and treat them appropriately. Uh, we don't know. Certainly many, many people have been... Uh, suffered very serious injuries. Some have suffered only minor. We do understand that uh, some of the people who were killed in this explosion were outside and across the street from the federal building. Once again, CNN is reporting that the bombing was a car bomb and that that car was parked right out in front of the federal building. Uh, clearly, the impact of that bombing uh, can be seen in, in the pictures that we've been looking at uh, of the front of the building. And this is, once again, unedited videotape recorded earlier this morning when the injured first began arriving at uh, area hospitals and triage centers. These pictures are unedited. Some of them are particularly shocking. Uh, we are no strangers to disaster here in Southern California. And uh, I know many people are interested in helping. They should contact their local Red Cross chapter to see if they can donate blood or what they can do if they are interested in providing help. And uh, this is uh, one of the hospitals, and they are on standby waiting for the ambulances to arrive. And, of course, there's a limited number of, of ambulances. They apparently have many people who are skilled medical technicians who have volunteered. They have them in the triage centers. The hospitals are ready. Uh, but just getting them to the hospitals is a problem. We see people literally taking their own shirts off and covering victims who uh, are in shock. Uh, I suspect that the, the emotional repercussions of this are going to be very, very far-reaching. Uh, many, many children involved in this as well. The uh, rescue officials are trying to connect the children from the daycare centers, uh, get them with their parents when they can determine what child belongs to which parent. This uh, is very reminiscent of what happened in New York City when the, the bombing at the World Trade Center, if we will recall that. Only this, as we have heard, is literally in the heartland of the United States, in Oklahoma City, and uh, uh, the shock in that city is absolutely overwhelming. I think that most of those people believed that uh, they were in a place that was safe where something like this could not happen. And of course there have been uh, repercussions across the United States, Wilmington, Delaware, and in um, uh, Boston, federal buildings have been evacuated as precaution. Helicopters are now landing to come in, and uh, here's the video of that. Right now, uh, the Oklahoma governor's office is reporting eight dead in this explosion, but uh, that is just a preliminary figure. We don't know yet uh, exactly what the death toll will be. But we have uh, helicopters now being brought into the area and landing. I'm not sure if this is, uh, if they are rescue personnel or uh, city officials, but we'll, we will have more pictures of that. Once again, we are seeing live video being fed from, uh, this is from another helicopter, so uh, they're having some trouble with their transmission, with their signal, and uh, that's why we're having the uh, jumpy pictures. Once again, the explosion in Oklahoma City occurred this morning at 9 o'clock Oklahoma City time, 7 a.m. our time. People, of course, had been coming to work probably since as early as 7 as said, probably about uh, uh, as many, uh, many uh, federal workers go into the office at 
around 8 o'clock in the morning. They leave their children in the daycare center, which uh, in Oklahoma City, the federal building provided a daycare center. We do not know at this time how many children were in the daycare center. We don't know the extent of their injuries. We do know two children were taken out uninjured, and uh, officials are now looking for their parents. These are two very, very small children who uh, can't uh, tell the uh, police or the rescue workers uh, who, to whom they belong. And now we have uh, pictures. These are pictures that were recorded earlier. We have uh, at, the ho at a local hospital the injured being taken in inside the hospital. They're arriving by ambulance. This has uh, clearly devastated. This is the Baptist Medical Center, as we see down at the bottom of our screen, uh, has devastated uh, the city of Oklahoma. We understand that the blast could be felt for as far as 50 miles. Here we have a little child who's being taken inside. This blast at 9 a.m. this morning, Oklahoma City time, could be felt for 50 miles. People, uh, uh, windows were blown out all over the city. Uh, t terrible damage to buildings immediately uh, adjacent to and across from the federal building, which, as we've seen the pictures of, literally had the whole front of it taken off and uh, all the way back two-thirds of that building uh, just gone in, in some places. But uh, the children that we're seeing uh, are from the daycare center in the federal building. Uh, some of these injuries uh, obviously are going to be uh, lacerations from the flying glass, and it has been uh, likened to shrapnel because the explosion was so intense that the glass uh, from these high-rise buildings just went flying in every direction. We've seen a number of people with um, cuts to their heads and uh, some people who have been uh, even more seriously injured. They are still searching for people who are trapped inside the federal building. I would imagine the rescue effort is going to be very difficult because that building, uh, I'm not sure how many stories it is. Uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't, uh, I don't have confirmation on how many stories it is. I do know that it's um, 315,000 square feet, but uh, I don't have a, um, I don't have a number of floors. However, you can see it looks to be about 10, 10 stories tall or 8 stories tall. And I would imagine that even getting people out through stairwells is going to be exceedingly difficult because the power of this blast uh, just pushed right from the north end of the building right through to the south end. And there is debris even on the south side. We're seeing aerials right now of the north side of the building. And uh, anyone who is trapped on one of those upper floors, it is going to be difficult to get them out. I would imagine the stairwells are also uh, filled with debris. And this has gone almost, uh, this one piece of the building has gone almost all the way through to the other side. And uh, you can see there's just the one side wall here standing. And uh, the entire front of that building is gone. We know four, 514 workers were assigned to the building. It is the AP Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. And the, large contingent, the largest contingent uh, is 177 workers. Uh, we're going to uh, go now to the Boston Fire Department. We have them on the telephone. Steve McDonald of the Boston Fire Department. We understand, uh, Mr. McDonald, that uh, the federal building in your city has also been evacuated because workers found some things out of place this morning in the uh, IRS office? Uh, that's correct. Uh, uh, workers in the IRS office, when they came to work this morning, found a, a door open. And uh, while they were concerned, uh, they really didn't... Uh, elevate their concern until they started seeing reports of what happened in Oklahoma City. Uh, the IRS uh, manager of the office uh, ordered his uh, floor evacuated, which is the 13th floor of a 22-story uh, federal high-rise. Uh, after he evacuated the workers, uh, the Boston Police Bomb Squad and the Boston Fire Department were called to the scene. We ordered the evacuation of the whole building uh, while we did a uh, systematic search of the building. Uh, nothing has been found uh, so far, and uh, no phone calls were received or any kind of threats like that. This is everything we've done has been strictly precautionary measure. It seems to me uh, probably to be a very wise idea. I know that uh, security measures here in Los Angeles have also been tightened. Um, Mr. McDonald, I appreciate your taking the time to talk to us. Of if there's any more information. Uh, uh, that we should know about. We'll check back with you or, uh, and uh, see how things are going in your city. We're very happy to hear that there has, you haven't found anything, and we hope that uh, the situation remains that way. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve McDonald in uh, Boston. That city evacuated the federal building when workers in the Internal Revenue Service offices 
uh, arrived at work today and found that things that were, should have been locked were not locked. Doors were open, uh, uh, cabinets apparently, filing cabinets of some sort were also unlocked and they should not have been. And as a precautionary measure only, as a precautionary measure only, they evacuated the Boston Federal Building. Now we are seeing pictures again of Oklahoma City. You can see that's just, this is uh, down on the ground evidently right in front of the building shortly after that bomb exploded. CNN is reporting that it was a car bomb. Let's listen in. Another hospital. So um, we're trying to uh, hook that up and make sure that everybody is connected here, but apparently the mother is injured as well. We have some numbers here we, we need to tell you about. I don't know if we can get them up, but we need to tell you about them because a lot of people are wondering who to call. If you have loved ones you want to check on, there's a number you need to call. It is 820-6801. 820-6801. That is the number to call. Another one, 820-6806. But again, Highway Patrol is cautioning everybody. If you're going to be going out and you have a mobile phone in your car, please don't use it unless it's an emergency. Devin, because the phone lines are so jammed. It's easy to think that just one little phone call won't matter, and we uh, tend to believe that uh, cellular phone space is just free open-air time, but each call is taking up a frequency, and uh, it could be a frequency very necessary. Marta Waller here. We also now have just received a report from Oklahoma City. Uh, Governor Frank Keating's office is reporting eight have been killed in that blast. A spokesman from that office, John Cox, says six of the dead our children, the children as uh, we have reported, were in a nursery daycare center on the first floor and the, uh, the second floor collapsed onto the daycare center in that building. We also know this was a nine-story building and people are still trapped in there and they are still trying to rescue those people. Uh, Eric Spillman is at our federal building in Westwood. Uh, security has been tightened down there, has it not, Eric? It sure has, and uh, most people who've driven by Wilshire Boulevard have seen this building many times. It has 17 stories and a lot of federal offices in here. That is why uh, they are concerned at this particular building and at other federal buildings here in Los Angeles and elsewhere in the country. They have added extra security as a result of what has happened in Oklahoma City. You see this line of people here. Uh, who are waiting to get into the building and one of the reasons why they're waiting in line is because at this building now there is only one entrance that is open they've restricted access to the building there's usually three entrances today only one because of what happened in oklahoma city you see this gentleman here who is a federal uh, police officer he is checking uh, badges of federal employees as they go in if you don't have a badge you got to wait in this line and go through a metal detector not only are they checking badges uh, for employees but they are rechecking them and joel if you can come over here we showed you this before actually you can't see her now but there's a there's an fbi agent right next to that concrete uh, uh pillar there on the right hand you can just barely see her but uh, she is also rechecking badges of uh of federal uh, employees who come through here and it's just a precautionary measure they want to make sure nobody is going in here uh, who shouldn't be and I've spoken to the Federal Protective Services which is the agency that uh, does the security for federal buildings and they are now officially on alert uh, at all federal uh, office uh, st uh, structures in the, in the Los Angeles area and the four main ones are this building here on Wilshire Boulevard and of course there's a, a courthouse on Spring Street in downtown Los Angeles also in downtown Los Angeles there's an immigration building and then there's the Roybal Federal Building also in downtown and they have uh, they've uh, heightened the security in all those locations and I'm told that at the immigration building which is on North uh, Los Angeles Street I believe that at that place they've actually added metal detectors so at buildings where they don't have metal detectors they've added them at this place they've had them here for quite some time and uh, so they're just uh, being more vigilant about letting letting people in i've spoken to a number of the uh, federal employees who work here and asked them listen are you nervous about uh, what's going on what you hear from oklahoma city and there's sort of a a feeling of resignation this is not the type of thing that anyone has any control over um, but they feel that they are uh, well protected and they, they are uh, obviously shocked to find out that federal employees are targets of, uh, of terrorist attacks, but uh, they just feel like there's not much they can do about it. They do feel safe, though, now that uh, extra people have been added here. So that's the situation here in Westwood. 
Back to you. Thank you very much, Eric. I imagine this is one time when uh, people are uh, don't mind standing in line to make sure that uh, getting into the building is safe. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. We'll check back with you again uh, in just a little while. We also have another report here. The head of the Bureau of Alco Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms now says that uh, this explosion appears to have been caused by a car bomb with as much as 1,200 pounds of explosives inside. Uh, that's just... I, it's just an unbelievably large bomb, and you can see what it's done. You can uh, look at this. You can see the front of the building. Uh, that appears to be... I'm not really sure what we're looking at at the front of the building. I get, guess that it's part of the steel structure, although at first I thought perhaps that was a uh, fire department ladder that had been uh, put up there in front of the building, but uh, to rescue people, it looks a little bit like that, but because the picture is a, a static picture, we don't have a big picture of what we're seeing. I'm not sure. We know there are still people trapped inside that building, and you can see there's just nothing left. Uh, the, steel, the steel frame of the building is just twisted wreckage, and uh, the floors have collapsed in on one another. The, uh, it was a nine-story building, and we have the police out here now. You can see this car, this car in front, which uh, I don't know if this is the car that they were, uh, that they're talking about, but every car in the area that was certainly in the parking lot was uh, damaged. And yes, see, that is a ladder going up to the building for the rescue effort, because I would imagine it would be very difficult to get people out of that building because there is undoubtedly, uh, obviously, no elevators and undoubtedly debris in all the stairwells. And uh, here are some of the cars that were right across the street. This is videotape that was recorded a little bit earlier. We are seeing pictures from two television stations in Oklahoma City. KWTV is what we're looking at right now. We are also receiving uh, videotape from KFOR. Uh, some of these uh, pictures are live. Some of them are recorded earlier. You can see them bringing uh, this man down from the building, uh, out of the damaged area of the building. And uh, I would suspect that the trauma of being in that building and trying to come down that ladder must be absolutely overwhelming. Uh, frightening to be inside and frightening to be coming down. Uh, clearly these people have gone through an unbelievable amount of trauma and I would imagine it's going to be very difficult for them, uh, uh, even those who are not injured or suffered only minor injuries, very, very difficult to go back to work. Uh, they are going to require a great deal of counseling and help, and I, would, I think that's probably something else that the city is also arranging for at this time will be crisis counselors, crisis intervention counselors to come in and talk to the people, the survivors of this. Uh, it is absolutely devastating to the people in Oklahoma City. This explosion happened at 9 o'clock this morning, Oklahoma City time. Let's listen in along the street. There have been a lot of ambulances coming from outside areas and they are ju here just waiting to go down there and get the other victims in this, uh, in this bombing. Right now they are asking people, um, doctors to report in, that sort of thing. They've got uh, just a, a backload of people and supplies here waiting to use it. And uh, we understand this will also be the area where they will keep any uh, bodies or people that um, were actually killed in this explosion. Back to you. All right, Terry, thanks. Let's, uh, let me read to you something that just came down off the Associated Press wire. Agriculture Department employee Brian Espy says his entire staff of seven people is gone. He says they're lost somewhere in the rubble of what had been a nine-story federal building. Espy says he's lucky to be alive. All but a couple offices in his area of the building's fifth floor just disappeared. Fellow Agriculture Department employee Jack Gobin says at first he thought it was an earthquake, but then the windows in his office blew in. Gobin says he got under his desk and was not hurt. And Tara had earlier uh, spoke with several people who said that that was how they survived it, by climbing under... And now we have another report that the federal building in Fort Worth, Texas has been evacuated as a precaution. The uh, security, as we know, at federal buildings across the United States has been heightened, but now this is the third federal building down downtown Fort Worth has been evacua evacuated as a precaution. Uh, the pictures we're seeing right now are uh, triage pictures. Uh, some of these people have uh, very, very serious injuries. And uh, as we heard from the Red Cross in Oklahoma City, the uh, entire population of the city has uh, pulled together to take care of the people who have been injured in this. 
who are going to need uh, a great deal of assistance. This explosion was felt for miles, uh, at least a 30-mile radius. Uh, we even have some reports of a 50-mile radius. Uh, people thought initially uh, those people who were in the uh, farther out areas thought perhaps it was an earthquake because the ground moved so, so abruptly, but uh, clearly the people in the immediate area realized that it was not. And we see, uh, this is, uh, I believe, videotape that was uh, shot earlier. This is definitely shot earlier, right after the explosion. You can see the fire department. Uh, and another problem uh, they were having, uh, that super, of course, is not right. That is not the federal building in West Los Angeles. Uh, that is in Oklahoma City. Uh, the parking lot, I mean, across the street, uh, all the cars that uh, caught fire during that uh, explosion. And now we are at uh, KOCO television, and we see another victim sitting there. This is the outside of the federal building, the north side of that building, uh, fully two-thirds of it uh, taken away in that explosion, which we now uh, are being told was a car bomb with 1,200 pounds of explosives inside. Uh, then they, there was a second, uh, what appeared to be a second bomb was found and the entire area was ev evacuated, including rescue workers who uh, were very reluctant to leave because they knew there were people trapped in that building. But uh, apparently other people were injured in the, the stampede to get away from that building when firefighters announced that they had found what appeared to be a second bomb. And uh, we're looking at pictures now of the outside of the federal building. I believe this is a live picture. And uh, no, it isn't. It, it was recorded earlier, but uh, this is the scene in Oklahoma City, even right now. The explosion happened at 9 o'clock this morning. 514 workers were assigned to the AP Murr building in Oklahoma City. Now, this is according to the General Services Administration records, and that was uh, as of about six months ago, so that's probably a pretty accurate number. We don't know how many people were actually at work. It was 9 o'clock in the morning, so my guess is that the building was probably pretty well occupied. Uh, federal offices tend to open uh, anywhere from probably 7.30 or 8 in the morning, and uh, as we have uh, reported, there are now eight people confirmed dead in this explosion. Uh, six of those are children, and there was a daycare center on the first floor of the building for employees of that, uh, of that uh, employees in the Very federal building. Obviously, the president's uh, first and foremost concern is that every uh, thing be done to assist those who are, have been victims of this incident to make sure that we've got the right and necessary type of assistance available uh, to local authorities in Oklahoma City and uh, he is satisfied that, that those steps are being taken. Secondly, he wants to make sure through proper law enforcement that everything is done as quickly as possible to bring whoever is responsible for this incident uh, quickly to justice. Now, he directed uh, this morning Leon Panetta to convene an interagency working group here at the White House that would just review how federal agencies are now responding and uh, we're satisfied based on the report that we have from the Department of Justice, from GSA, uh, from the FBI, from FEMA, uh, from the Secret Service, uh, from the Marshal Service, uh, from all the relevant federal agencies that might have a role here in dealing with this incident, that we have a very good uh, federal response in hand. The federal government has activated an emergency response plan that uh, uh, we train for and that we have in place so that we can coordinate an interagency response to incidents like this. Uh, the Department of Justice uh, had already responded, had FBI personnel in place, a variety of law enforcement uh, efforts underway. They've established a mobile command center in Oklahoma City with uh, FBI, FEMA, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the Marshal Service, and GSA in place uh, to give updated information to, to folks here in Washington. The President has directed uh, for the emergency response efforts that James Lee Witt, uh, the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, will go to Oklahoma City to coordinate the emergency response. So we'll have DOJ coordinating uh, the various law enforcement efforts that will be underway and FEMA responding to the emergency situation uh, in place. The, Mr. Panetta has been briefing the president regularly. The president, I expect, like many Americans, has been 
uh, watching the developments as he sees them on television and uh, getting updates from the chief of staff as we go along. Uh, I'd ask that you, for inquiries about the various uh, things going on in Oklahoma City related to law enforcement, you stay in close contact with Carl Stern over at Justice and for the work that FEMA will be coordinating that uh, Maury Goodman will be a good point of contact. They'll be coordinating some of the interagency uh, public affairs efforts as we go along. What do you know about it so far in terms of the casualties and the possibility that it might have been a bomb? Well, we know very little hard information. We've heard a lot of different reports. We're getting good information from the field, but uh, they're at the very early stages. Uh, they have been investigating this incident and it is way too early at this point to draw any conclusions about what has happened in Oklahoma City. Clearly there's been a devastating uh, explosion that's occurred at this uh, federal building, but the cause of it is unknown. Uh, those responsible are unknown at this point and uh, we'll have to develop that very carefully in the course of the coming hours and days. Uh, we don't have a reliable one that's being uh, worked on, the, uh, again, stay in contact with the local authorities on the ground there who have the best information as they get it available. Yeah. Has security been heightened in the federal buildings and here in the White House? Well, we would take at any moment like this. You're seeing now a variety of sporadic reports from federal buildings around the country that are uh, getting uh, alleged uh, threats. And, uh, you know, as federal agencies do, we will respond appropriately. We have directed and the federal buildings take uh, any necessary precautions just to uh, respond as they would in a in a routine way anytime we sense that there is some reason to believe that there's uh, an incident that's occurred that raises the level of threat. Any reports of a threat in Oklahoma City that may have preceded this? They are uh, looking now through everything available uh, in the information that was available to the federal government to see. We don't have a concrete answer. We're not aware of any at this point. Are you aware of any kind of uh, conspiracy or plot that could bring this? We're at the very early stages of investigating this incident, and it would be way too early to develop any good information on anything like that yet, Joe. Mike, in terms of the response here at the White House, do, when these uh, agency, interagency groups start up, is there a process <laughs> where they automatically do things because the president jumped in himself and said something must be done? There is a, there is a good federal emergency management plan in effect, uh, which includes you know, a White House component that the Chief of Staff is now executing at the direction of the President. Uh, obviously, in this situation, the President wants to make sure that the White House uh, stays right on top of an uh, administration response to make sure that the appropriate things are being done. But we're satisfied in large part because of our experience in dealing with incidents uh, of this nature or related types of incidents. So we've got good planning in effect, and that's all underway at this point. It, uh, there are a lot of things. The, the federal agencies like the FBI, like Justice, uh, like GSA, uh, did have planning in effect that kicked in automatically. And here at the White House, uh, we established a, a small interagency working group to make sure we monitored all the proper developments from these various agencies. Will this affect the security plan for the White House, the future plan? It's entirely too early to say. That was a review that was still at the Treasury Department, and uh, we'd be jumping to conclusions if we suggested there was anything about today's incident in Oklahoma City that had any bearing on that security well, review. Do you to make a statement before the end of the day on this? I suspect the President will. I think later, or later in the day, I think he, uh, he wants to make sure that people have got the best av information available to him, you and I suspect later in the day he'll be here, yeah. Security here at the White House, have you done? We've taken precautions that we would normally take uh, following an incident like this, yes. <coughs> yes Mike, Jack. Mike, you talked about the uh, person is unknown responsible for this. Is that, can you confirm that this actually was a bomb, and can you say what kind of bomb I, it was? I would hesitate to do that because there are people on the ground that are looking very carefully at exactly that type of question. I can tell you that uh, law enforcement officials are investigating it as a crime scene, uh, and they are, you know, for that reason, all the relevant law enforcement agencies are uh, in place and responding. Yeah, Ann. Is this developed after the World Trade Center or in recent Well, there, there, there has, there's a variety of that type of planning that has been in place over time. Uh, I'm not sure when it came into effect here. I, I haven't participated in another federal agency. I know that they routinely update a lot of their 
planning activities, and I think they do uh, build on past experience. References to procedures normally taken after an incident such as right. this. I don't recall x-raying of lunches and bags and stuff after the World Trade Center or after any other incident uh, in recent you know, Maybe I just didn't notice, but isn't this some new level that we've not seen before? I, th I think we are you know, taking precautions as you would expect us to take following an incident of this nature and following uh, uh, threats that have been going to some isolated federal uh, facilities around the country. I'm not aware of any threat here directed against the White House. I'm not, uh, I don't know entirely about all of the federal installations around Washington. I only know about here at the White House. Yeah. Is it likely that the President will want to visit the site at some point? Oh, I, uh, he wants to make sure that the proper law enforcement is in place and that the right emergency response is taking place. It's way too early to make judgments about that. Can you confirm that they found an unexploded bomb or an unexploded device? I cannot. How yeah. many, how many uh, threats have been received around the country? Can you give us any idea about the I, uh, we, we frankly hear about them from news organizations probably even faster than we hear about them through uh, the channels that we've got available to c accumulate accurate information. There have been several on the wires already, as you probably know. Yeah, Jack. Will, will Justice or ATF, the FBI, give a readout or a detailed briefing on this by the end of the day? Yeah, they're putting in place their own planning to respond to, to public inquiries about what's happened, make sure they've got people in place, both in Oklahoma City and here in Washington, who can uh, respond to specific uh, concerns, and they, they will do that. I've talked, but as I mentioned before, both to Maury Goodman and to Carl Stern at Justice and FEMA, uh, respectively, and they're going to be in a position to tell you more about how their uh, agencies and subordinate agencies are responding. Are there yeah. groups that are already being looked at or scrutinized? Are, are as, as, as those who may have... Who no, may I'm have not aware that they've developed any uh, any leads that would suggest a target for an investigation at this point. Does the president change his plans in any way today? Uh, I don't believe so. He proceeded with the meeting with Prime Minister Chilair, and he's got some uh, additional meetings taking place later today, and he will, as, as the day goes on, be uh, updated uh, on a regular basis by either the Chief of Staff or anyone else appropriate working with this uh, interagency group. Mike, is it planned that there would be, you know, one central briefing that would bring in, let's say, Justice and FEMA and everybody else? Uh, not at the moment. I think that, that they're all concentrating at their own workplaces, using their own uh, command centers and their own channels back to Oklahoma City. So I think it's more appropriate for them to kind of stay on top of what they've got going on at their individual agencies. We'll check and see later on today if the president does have something to say, who else we might have with him. We'll let you know as the afternoon goes on. Yeah, okay. this uh, contingency plan that was put into effect, is it an anti-terrorism plan? Does it have a name? It's uh, just the, referred to as the emergency response plan. It is not uh, directed at any specific threat because at this point we don't have any credible information that lets us understand precisely what type of incident this uh, was in Oklahoma City. What types of emergencies has it been designed for? Is it? Oh, it's, it, it's fairly comprehensive and covers uh, things that you would imagine, including natural disasters. Yeah. Are there any number of federal agencies that try to monitor the possibility of these sorts of attacks or actions? To your knowledge, did any federal agency have any indication whatsoever that, a, that an effort was underway to stage this kind of thing? Or was this whole thing a complete surprise to the federal government? Uh, to my knowledge at this time, there was nothing that suggested that this incident was going to occur. But as you can well imagine, we were very carefully scrubbing every available piece of information, uh, digging as deeply as we can to see if there's anything that might provide a uh, helpful lead. Has the president talked to the governor or anyone uh, personally? The chief of staff has placed a call to the governor. Uh, the president plans to make some calls this afternoon to uh, members of Congress and to others just to bring them up to date on what the federal government's response has been to date. Uh, and he will continue to uh, keep apprised himself of anything developing. Yeah, way in the back. Has there been any speculation on the correlation of Wake, the two-year anniversary of Waco, Texas and this bombing? Uh, there's not, not been anything substantive that suggests that connection, but uh, there has been speculation, most of it coming from a variety of news organizations reporting on that uh, coincidence at this point. Do you know the president passed a call? Uh, I don't know for sure, Brett. I think he's going to be in touch with members of the delegation and others. Okay.
Okay, we've been listening to a live news conference with Mike McCurry, White House spokesperson, uh, answering a number of questions about that bombing in Oklahoma City. We have some uh, statistics for you of uh, what has happened. That explosion occurred 9 o'clock this morning in the federal building. Eight people are being reported dead, at least 200 injured. Of those eight deaths, six are confirmed to be children who were in the daycare center in the building on the first floor. We understand that the second floor of the building collapsed in onto the daycare center in that building. At least 200 people have been injured. Right now we have Dr. Rich Krieg. He is the chief operating officer in Los Angeles for the American Red Cross. Uh, uh, good uh, morning, Dr. Krieg. Good morning. Now, what is the situation here? I understand that you've been absolutely flooded with telephone calls from people who want to help out. That's correct. Uh, when I came in this morning at about uh, just before 8 o'clock, the, uh, <clears throat> the phones were, were busy at that time and we've been directing uh, people that would like to donate blood to our 800 numbers to set up appointments. Now, uh, and that is something that they can do and, and there's a, a reciprocal agreement and this is, uh, is that correct? Uh, yes, what, we've, what we do is we contact the, the local Red Cross there, which happens to be in Tulsa, and uh, check with them to see uh, how their blood supply is and whether or not they've had any requests from the, the non-Red Cross Center, which is in Oklahoma City. And uh, the Red Cross also has a uh, donor site, which is about 15 miles outside of Oklahoma City, which they have activated. Um, and if blood is collected here and we do need blood in some other part of the country, um, we go ahead and manage that through a, a national inventory management system, which we have set up in St. Louis. It's a, it's a large depot that receives excess blood from regions and then distributes it, distributes it to areas there where it is needed. It certainly looks like uh, Oklahoma City is going to be an area that is going to be in desperate need of blood. Uh, at least 200 people have been injured, and uh, we are now hearing 200 plus people have been injured, uh, some of them very, very seriously. Right, and I, I think that even if the, the need doesn't exist right at this moment, there are going to be a number of operations that will be uh, scheduled uh, throughout uh, probably this week, and uh, so there will be a continual need for blood to uh, to make sure there's an adequate supply to uh, to support them. A couple of uh, uh, points before we go. What is uh, the the number that uh, people in Southern California can call to contact the Red Cross? Okay, for, to make a blood uh, donation, mm -hmm. uh, we have two different 800 numbers. Uh, okay. The easiest one to remember is 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Okay. And then they can also call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Uh, 974-2113. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, build a graphic with that and put that number up in just a little while. Um, what else can people do? Is there anything else they can do besides give blood? Are you going to be uh, checking with Oklahoma City to see if there are uh, things they need that... Uh, I, I, and I say this largely because here in Southern California we are no strangers to disaster, as you well know, and we've received an outpouring of help and support when we have had earthquakes and floods and, and devastating fires and I think there are many people here who would like to you know reciprocate return that favor as you said your your telephone line was absolutely flooded is there anything else people can do or is blood the the most important thing no I think that uh, in addition to blood uh, there's always a need for financial donations to support the activities that are taking place right now in Oklahoma City with, that the Red Cross is supporting and as as here with the mudslides and the earthquakes and fires and such, there's always a tremendous need for for donations, but not only products. I think for people in in, uh, uh, in the L.A., Orange County area, the, the easiest way to help would be for a financial donation that could be uh, sent to the local chapters, to the, the L.A. chapter here on Wilshire or uh, Orange County. Just made, just made out to the American Red Cross? Correct. Okay, and now let me just make sure before I let you go, these two numbers are 1-800-GIVE-LIFE and 1-800-974-2113. Correct. Okay, and we'll build a graphic for that and we'll uh, show it to our viewers uh, in just a few minutes. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Krieg, for taking uh, the time to talk to us. And uh, I am sure that uh, we'll be hearing, uh, you'll be, you will be hearing a great deal from the people of Southern California. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Once again, you are looking at picture from, pictures from KFOR-TV in Oklahoma City. This was recorded earlier, and as they have, uh, and let's listen in right now to uh, their reporters.
hospital as well. Nine different medical complexes are involved. They've been receiving phone calls from as far away, offers of help from as far away as Chicago, wanting to know if uh, they needed any uh, assistance, any expertise. And uh, it's hard to find expertise in something like this because how in the world can you possibly prepare for what we are seeing right now in the streets of downtown? Just a few exceptions that we can think of. Uh, the World Trade Center being one, places where they've seen this sort of disaster, this sort of scale, this sort of introduction into what we fear is some kind of awful political toll that someone has tried to exact on Oklahoma City. Uh, the first thing they're looking at right now, Devin, the federal authorities looking at terrorism. And Tom Brokaw of NBC News just completed an interview with Neil Livingston. He is an expert in terrorism and terroristic bombings. And let's take a look at that tape if we can. He was recently in Oklahoma City. Neil Livingston was recently in Oklahoma City giving a talk. That comes from John McGar, director of the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF. Uh, he says uh, clearly the explosion occurred outside the building in front of the building. As to whether it's, uh, his agency suspect terrorists, uh, he says, I think any time you have this kind of damage, uh, you have to look there first. So uh, at this point, they are beginning to confirm the reports that we've given you previously about a car with a bomb in it just in front of the court. Well, I, think we have, I, think, I think we can get video of that car for you. We want to show you the car where it is believed maybe that bomb was planted. Uh, We'll try to get video of that. They're working on that now. Uh, this was shot by uh, photojournalist R.D. Rowland, who was right outside uh, in front of this building uh, during the period of time where people were being allowed there before they determined there might be another explosive device. This is uh, kind of the, if I'm seeing this right, this is sort of the uh, courtyard area on the north or the south side of the uh, federal building where I think they were doing some triage earlier. They've since moved people back from this location. And that's part of the uh, herd of people that you saw running down what I think was Fifth Street. Now there's the car. That's the car that was parked apparently out in front of the federal building this morning and perhaps carried an explosive device that devastated the building at about nine o'clock here in downtown Oklahoma City. We do also want to remind people who are at home worried about friends and loved ones that uh, the number that the civil defense gave out a little while ago has just quite frankly been flooded and they've been unable to take all of the calls. So they're asking you to hold off on that right now. If uh, a loved one has been injured, they will, the hospital will notify you. And as soon as we get some kind of information, a phone... Uh, possibly as many as two other bombs. We're looking for that. Uh, we're trying to confirm that... In okay, we are now looking at uh, live pictures of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Nine o'clock this morning, that building uh, was destroyed by what is believed to be a car bomb. Uh, containing as much as 1,200 pounds of explosives. And uh, in, the, in the wake of this bombing, there have been a number of uh, evacuations, precautionary evacuations in Boston. The federal building was evacuated as a precaution when employees for the Internal Revenue Service arrived at work this morning. They found certain things were not the way they should have been. Doors that should have been locked were open. Wilmington, Delaware evacuated their federal, federal building. A police sergeant would not confirm whether or not this was the result of a bomb threat. They, uh, we simply were told that this was the result of a, uh, a extra caution. And in Fort Worth, Texas, the federal building was evacuated as another, again, as a precaution. And uh, this bombing of the federal building this morning at 9 a.m. in Oklahoma City has had uh, far-reaching effects the security at the federal buildings here in Los Angeles, as we heard from Eric Spillman at, uh, in Westwood, at the federal building in Westwood, has been tightened. People are being screened very carefully before they are allowed to go inside the federal buildings. Uh, we have the federal building in Westwood, the immigration building downtown Los Angeles, federal courthouse downtown Los Angeles, the Royal Ball federal building in downtown Los Angeles. So uh, the uh, security is very tight at those buildings and here you can see down on the ground shortly after the explosion this is unedited unedited videotape we are receiving pictures from two stations in oklahoma city kfor and kwtv and uh, these pictures were recorded just after the explosion uh, firefighters on the scene uh, we don't see explosions like this in the united states we've seen it in other countries and uh, uh, certainly in Oklahoma City, they are absolutely devastated. They felt that uh, they were pretty much safe from that type of, from this type of terrorism, which is what they are 
saying at this point is that when you have a bombing like this, you have to look at, you have to look at uh, terrorism first. And uh, let's listen in right now. Uh, we just got that word from uh, Larry Jones. They're also down here trying to help uh, bring in food. They're going to be bringing any children who may be in there, bringing them out first. Uh, I want to talk with a gentleman now who, whose son works for the Oklahoma City Police Department. Uh, Mr. Ramsey, thanks so much for joining us. Tell me what you were saying about your son. He, he, he heard the explosion. He was not t uh, a few blocks away because he works downtown. He was at the Oklahoma City Police Station. He said about 300 people, 300 policemen pulled their guns because they thought that someone was in the police department had set off a bomb in the... Uh, the police department there and then of course they discovered he's a bicycle patrolman and he immediately uh, and, and he went in the building and, and what did he he uh was sharing with us that he had pulled out uh four uh two to three year olds that were dead uh, i think six adults that were dead and uh, he's got a daughter that's three years old and when he got to the part about the kids he couldn't stand it too much because i you know it's my granddaughter and, and, this has and I can't see how anybody do this. It's unreal. Uh, he also saw a lot of people, you said, who were in pain. Maimed and, you know, tops of their heads blown off and eyes blown out. Did horrible, horrible things. And, uh, you know, to the people that did this, there is no reason for anything like this. None, ever. Mr. Ramsey, thank you very much. I think Mr. Ramsey uh, ha has best uh, verbalized how we all feel. We don't understand what's going on. No one, uh, we spoke with Congressman Iztuk, who is uh, also here. He said that they are going to desperately try to find out who placed that car bomb, why they did it, uh, and make those who are responsible certainly uh, pay in the way that justice usually prevails. Uh, again, we understand that they're going to, the rescuers are in the building now trying to get children out, trying to get any survivors out. Uh, we'll stay here on the scene, and, and if we can get one of those rescues, we'll get back to you. Been from the YMCA daycare across the street. Incredible. Yeah. We thought those injuries in terms of the children were isolated to that building, but obviously not so. Flying glass is affecting children I think, there. Yes, I think flying glass is affecting a lot of people downtown. It's a real, it's an incredible effort, is it not, with the oh. medical professionals in this city? They called for doctors, and it is amazing uh, the number of staff physicians, surgeons, medical, family physicians, ophthalmologists, neurosurgeons, everybody is there standing by, looking at CAT scans, looking at x-rays, just pitching in, as well as the non-physician medical staff. It's, it's, it's just a, it's a wonderful effort by everybody to get things moving, and we're hoping to save as many people as possible as soon as those crews can get in. The last word we're getting in terms of fatigue is eight. Are you hearing anything different? Uh, I have. I don't have any official any official word on that. I have heard uh, reports of 15 to 20, but there's no confirmation in my mind on that. And in terms of injuries, it's countless at this point, is it not? I think so. I think some of the the easier injuries we've seen because they um, they were able to drive themselves to the hospital, pick up their children, and come. I think we expect this afternoon many more of the more serious injuries as the emergency crews can get in there. What were some of the things? As people were saying they had to be in a complete state of shock they were they were just shocked there was one little boy brought in four years old and he just wasn't doing anything and we were really worried about him and then luckily as we started to suture him he started to cry we were so happy oh, because wow. we saw some more uh, life coming out of him. some emotion yes it really is it's it's it is just frightening again let's remind everyone before we send it back to the studio if you go to a hospital make it family members only immediate on. really immediate family members we really need to cut down on the parking the extraneous people around there are hundreds of doctors nurses medical personnel around and we need to le let them have the right of way so immediate relatives go down check with the hospital as soon as you go in go to their central triage area um, I think in hours at Baptist it's in the cafeteria so that you can find out what floor um, your patient or your family member has been taken to we're looking for a lot of answers Today, Jennifer, you had a question for Dr. Bowman, do you not? I do have a question. Dr. Bowman, one of the things that Chief Hansen has just told us is that, that there are going to be, uh, it could be two or three days that some of these victims are still trapped inside this building. We're looking at temperatures down into the 50s tonight. We're going to have medically some exposure problems with these kind of temperatures? That's a good question. We were talking with John Hansen earlier. He said this could be a three-day search for victims inside the building. It's cold overnight. What are some of the concerns there for those people? Shock. Get out. Get them ready. 
And this is the point now where the evacuations began again, and you can see everybody starting to leave downtown for fear that the exact same thing was about to happen again. Fortunately, it didn't because the second device that they found, we understand, was even more powerful than the first. They then found a third device, and you can see the look on this woman's face at the fear that she might have to go through the same thing again. They then found a third device, which was also larger than the first. Uh, hard to feel lucky at this point, but certainly through uh, some good work by some munitions experts and the uh, explosive sniffing dogs, further tragedy has almost certainly been averted here uh, today. It may look like a scene out of Beirut, but it's Oklahoma City, folks. Downtown Oklahoma City, a live picture of what used to be the Alfred Murrah Federal Building. As Devin told you, a 1,200-pound car bomb exploded in front of the building today, the nine-story building. We're hearing that 900 people may have been inside. So far, we have eight fatalities in the tragedy that makes it even worse. Six of them were children. A daycare located on the second floor of this building. Two adults confirmed dead at this time, too. And as you peer there into the middle floors of the federal building, uh, John Hansen... Okay, you are looking at live pictures from KFOR-TV in Oklahoma City. We are receiving videotape from two stations, KFOR and KWTV. Uh, this is the north side of the federal building, an uh, explosion at 9 o'clock this morning, uh, literally took away, it, it destroyed two-thirds of the building. Uh, 200 plus people are injured. They do not have an accurate count at this time. We do know eight people have been reported killed in this bombing, and of those eight people, six were children. Uh, there's a, there was a daycare center on the first floor of the federal building for employees of that building. Uh, we don't know at this time how many children were actually in the daycare center at that time, but some of them were very, very small infants, uh, as young as a year of age. And uh, there are also injuries uh, apparently to children who were at the YMCA across the street from the federal building. Of course, uh, the explosion was so powerful that uh, windows were blown out throughout the city. The explosion could be felt uh, for a radius of at least 30 miles, and we've also heard reports that it was felt as far as 50 miles away. We know many people here in Southern California would like to help out. Uh, the place to contact, and we're going to put the numbers up for you right now, is the American Red Cross. Call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE or 1-800-974-2111. Three. And these are numbers you can call for the American Red Cross if you want to donate blood. We also know that if you, uh, one of the other things you can do that is important is to donate cash. If you, if uh, a money donation is always useful and it's something they can, uh, they can put to use quickly because that money, of course, can be transferred to Oklahoma City immediately. Here are the two numbers again, 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. 1-800-974-2113. We know that blood is desperately needed in Oklahoma City. We're looking again at the pictures of the federal building. These pictures were recorded earlier, a helicopter, uh, helicopter video from uh, above the federal building. The uh, helicopter is coming around to the north side of the building. We understand there may have been, uh, right now it is reported that uh, the explosion was caused by a car bomb with 1,200 pounds of explosives in it, and uh, we want to listen in right now. They're telling us now that they have all the volunteers that they need at this point. If you'd like to be a volunteer, they will probably need help further on later today. So wait a couple of hours, and then rather than bothering to call, just go on down to the mobile blood unit with the, where the Red Cross is set up at 601 Northeast 6th Street. You make it appear as if it was the Nation of Islam, but uh, again, that's just conjecture at this point. It happens to be something that the President uh, agrees with. Uh, so there's no way of telling at this point uh, uh, whether or not that has anything to do with it. All right, you do know it's a terrorist uh, type of... Uh, this is the conclusion you have to come. Uh, Senator, are you satisfied with what the President told you about the federal response? That everything's being done right I am satisfied with the federal response, and I'm also sta satisfied with the state response. I talked to uh, Governor Keating, and, and uh, I think we're doing everything we can. And uh, it, it, so, but again, uh, it's, it's a tough one to handle. We're just going to have to get to the bottom of it. Lots of questions uh, out there today, Senator, regarding this. And I'm sure lots of Americans are scratching their heads and saying, Oklahoma City? It can happen anywhere. 
uh, if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere else. And I think that, and the president again uh, stated this, and we both agreed on on this that it's uh, first we try to save the lives that are there now, then we try to find out what it is because uh, this is too well orchestrated in my. Uh, view uh, not to be something connected with terrorist activities, and we're going to have to stop it. Uh, stressing that we don't know who's behind this, we did talk with the former uh, Oklahoma Congressman Dave McCurdy earlier today, who talked about the uh, some Islamic groups uh, that are in that city that have caused concerns and uh, have been watched. Uh, what, what do you know about that? Well, I, I just wouldn't want to comment on Dave McCurdy. He was the one I beat for this job, and. Uh, and I, I don't think that he has any information uh, uh, other than what the president has. And I, I just talked to the president. I think it's probably doing a disservice to be uh, coming to conclusions uh, concerning the uh, nation of Islam at this point. Well, what will people need in Oklahoma City uh, uh, as this day and, and the days? Uh... As beforehand, it would have been of tremendous value. Uh, I don't know myself. I know that there had been a, a threat phoned in. Uh, to the FBI last week. I don't know what the nature of that was, but yes, they do generally try to, to claim credit. Uh, but remember that all, all targets for terrorism are symbolic. Uh, we have to divine what was the symbolism of that building. Was it the fact that the ATF were there and is somehow linked to Waco? Uh, was there some uh, court case going on and sort of investigation uh, that would link it to a terrorist group such as uh, Abdul Rahman's group in New York? I think that's what we're going to try to find out. But that's the question everybody has right now. Why here? Why Oklahoma City? And, and uh, you find out by finding why that building. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's material that it was in Oklahoma City. It's really the building. The building could have been in any city in the United States. The question is why that building? And was it Waco? Uh, is it uh, the Nation of Islam? We should find out an awful lot uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. As you're mentioning, it, it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City. But it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. When I was at the World Trade Center bombing two years ago, Doctor, there really was this very palpable sense that we had somehow lost our innocence. Uh, wouldn't you assume that now, I mean, maybe you can understand somebody picking a target like the World Trade Center, but once they move to some place like the Federal Building in Oklahoma City, uh, the fear would be that this is all going to get a lot worse before it ever gets better. Uh, the great problem is that it's the simplicity of terrorism. You can fly from New York to Oklahoma City city or from anywhere else in a matter of a couple of hours. Uh, you can get a, a, an explosive device, and this is probably some high explosives uh, packed with fertilizer, which you can pick up virtually anywhere. Uh, the, basic, the basic mechanics of terrorism are simple, and uh, this is a great fear, and not wanting to... Just received word, uh, we have just received word that President Clinton has ordered that emergency federal assistance be offered to Oklahoma City because of that explosion at 9 a.m. They uh, believe that, uh, uh, we also hear that uh, officials at federal buildings have been told to take all necessary precautions as we know many federal buildings have been evacuated. Uh, here in Los Angeles, let's check in with Eric Spillman. He is at the federal building in Westwood. Uh, Eric. Hey, Marta, the uh, federal building in Westwood, 11,000 Wilshire Boulevard. It's uh, usually security is high here anyways because they get, uh, they do get an, a number of threats here occasionally. Occasionally they get bomb threats because the building is is so well known as a, as a headquarter for federal offices. Today, though, security is much, much tighter than it normally is. This entrance, it's the main entrance to the federal building here, but there's a sign on there that says use side door. And the reason why is because they've restricted the... Uh, entrances to the building here today. They're only using one. Normally there'd be three open. There you see folks going through uh, the metal detector. Of course, that's par for the course. They do that every day here at this building, but today it's even slower than normal. There's a line uh, going outside the building over there, um, and that is most of those people are waiting for passports. In addition, if you work in this building, you're supposed to have a badge. So all federal employees are being checked at the door for their badge by a security officer. And as well, if you pan to the left, uh, Joel, you'll see that there is an FBI agent in the corridor there as well that they have added. That person is not normally here uh, doing that type of thing. But what they're doing today is rechecking badges of federal employees. Every federal employee who comes through here uh, is now checked twice. And all of that is because of what happened in Oklahoma City 
um, this morning. We'll come back around here and show you uh, the front of the building here, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, it is a huge building. I've tried to find out how many people work here. It's 17 stories uh, high, and they have just about every federal agency that you can imagine here, from the FBI to the Department of State, the Passport Agency, Department of Commerce. So there are a lot of federal workers who are who are in this building, and we've spoken to a number of them this morning and asked them uh, whether they are concerned, and many of them say that uh, they have confidence in the security measures that are being taken here. Again, they're shocked to hear that uh, uh, federal employees apparently are targets of terrorist attacks, as they were this morning in Oklahoma City, but they have, uh, they're, they're confident that the extra security uh, will be helpful in, in this uh, situation here. And I should add that security has been beefed up not only at this federal uh, building, but at others in, in Los Angeles as well, particularly uh, in downtown LA. There's a big federal courthouse and an immigration uh, uh, office and the Roy Ball Federal Building in downtown Los Angeles as well. They brought in, we understand, they brought in extra metal detectors for the immigration building in downtown LA. Normally they don't use them there, but uh, as of this morning they are using metal detectors at that location. So that's a, a basic update on the uh, security uh, increase that's taken place at all federal buildings uh, in Southern California and really across the country uh, as a result of what happened in Oklahoma City. Okay, thank you very much, Eric, and I imagine that those uh, security precautions are going to remain in force uh, for some time. We uh, are once again looking at pictures of Oklahoma City. Let's uh, take a look at this uh, picture and we'll listen in to uh, the television station in Oklahoma City. Fears developed uh, that there were uh, more explosive devices in place. Here comes a little one being taken out right now, being delivered to a local hospital. And there's the tragedy of this explosion, folks, right there in that man's arms. Six children have been confirmed as fatalities. That little one, obviously not one. But many children being taken to the hospital to be looked at. You can see the medical personnel standing around, ready to help do what they can to ease not only the pain, but the immense fear these people have at this point and the shock that goes along with it. There's another little one, a lady being brought out as a tent to the wounded from the Murrah building. And we'll mention again, there was a daycare on the second floor of the building. Uh, among the other uh, entities housed in the federal building, the uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Unit is in there. Social Security offices are housed in there. A couple of offices uh, involved with HUD, Housing and Urban Development, is in there as well. Uh, military recruiting offices, several federal judges' offices. Uh, so just a wide-ranging, uh, all of it connected with the federal government, but a very wide-ranging uh, agenda of, uh, and slate of offices that are housed in there. And as Jana Davis told us earlier, it is believed that there were perhaps 900 people inside the building uh, when all this happens. So certainly we can see that uh, days, weeks, years from now, just about all of us will know somebody who was in the building at the time or will know someone who did. Let's go to Lee Evans right now at the update desk. He has more information for us, Lee. Kevin and Devin, um, we've been looking at video of the explosion. Well, we have some new information, and Congressman Ernest Istik says he's received information that the explosion at the federal building was caused by a car bomb. Um, there have been some, uh, there has been some speculation about that, but he is saying that the information he's received was that the explosion was caused by a car bomb. He says the bomb blew a crater about 30 feet wide in the site at the building. Uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, well, we can't see the building right now, but if you look at the building, when you, we get a shot of that right back up, you can see how huge that was. Istuk said six Secret Service agents are unaccounted for out of 13. Six Secret, six secret Service agents that were uh, in that office are now unaccounted for out of 13, and the bomb basically rocked the downtown Oklahoma City building. We all know that at about 9 o'clock this morning, at least eight people died more than, and listen to this number, 200 people were injured. Also, President Clinton just called Frank Frank uh, Keating, Governor Frank Keating, and he says that three FBI anti-terrorist teams are en route to Oklahoma City. Right now, they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device, and um, it has to have been done by an explosives expert, um, obviously with this type of explosion. We're going to take it right back to you at the desk. We okay. heard earlier from uh, Dr. Heather, who told us that the fact that they were able to find some yeah. of these devices undetonated is certainly going to help in their investigation. Jeff Lazalier, I believe, is in downtown Oklahoma City, has some new information for us. Let's go to Jeff. 
All right, back down here to live to Oklahoma City um, with John Hansen, Assistant Fire Chief. We've heard from you already, but just bring us up to date. What is the absolute latest information you're being told at this location? Well, Jeff, uh, we're still inside the building systematically searching it. We still have survivors inside that building we're working to, uh, to remove. We still have people trapped inside the building. And uh, we're setting up for a night operation at this time because uh, there's some areas of the building we haven't been able to get to yet. Uh, very slow. We've got to slow down now. We've still got a danger of collapse in the building, as you can see the devastation behind us. And uh, uh, those are priorities, obviously, is life safety. You know, we're, we're in some dangerous situations. Pr pretty frustrating that we have to be so slow, but uh, uh, we're doing that for the safety of our rescuers and the safety of the potential survivors. Can you talk at all about any other bombs? Because we've heard things thrown about all morning long. Tell us the latest on, uh, we, obviously one bomb blew up. What about any others? Okay, the bomb squad told us that if there had been a secondary device, that the violent explosion from the primary device would have detonated it. So uh, we have bomb squad members inside the building with our rescue teams in case we do come across something, they can take care of it immediately. So the original uh, word on the street of uh, possibly as many as three bombs in total is not necessarily true at this time? Uh, nothing that I know of to confirm that. Okay. Now we've also, obviously we just have a big bus driving by, so you can probably see it and hear the noise, so I'm going to speak up a little bit here. We, we've heard rumors, uh, and again, tell me if this is confirmed, six children dead and two adults so far. Okay, we, we've heard eight dead, but uh, I don't have the breakdown yet. I'm going back inside the building now, Jeff, to try to get uh, a, a more accurate count of things for you, and I'll, I'll be out in about an hour. I'm okay. going to go in with our crew and see how we're doing. And one final thing is that there's a, there was a word on uh, collapse, and you mentioned that earlier, right after the initial bomb blast. Part of the building collapsed. Uh, has there been any other collapse since then? We've had some minor uh, secondary collapses inside the building. Uh, and, and that's going to happen to us. We've got to be very careful as we remove rubble that's unstable. Uh, there's some things that we don't want to cause for ourselves, but uh, that's always a possibility right now, and yes, we have had some secondary collapses. What about other buildings in the area that are very, very close here? What about uh, any of these other buildings that have been hit hard about this uh, 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 with this blast? Are there any other buildings that are in serious danger right now? Yes, Jeff, uh, across the street, and there are, there are some area buildings, as, as you can see, that... Uh, have some pretty significant structural damage. These people are going to have to get structural engineers in those buildings to check the integrity prior to letting their employees back in. Again, I think Mayor Noick this afternoon will have an announcement as to uh, uh, if people want to stay that stay down stay out of downtown tomorrow. Okay. So. Well, tell me about the emotional effect on the firefighters and the rescue people that are working. You brought people in as far away as Tulsa, Davis, Oklahoma. There's people from all over the state coming in here. Uh, what kind of an emotional toll are these people going to be facing? And are you setting up a, an emotional triage for your workers? Yes, sir. We've got a critical incident stress debriefing area set up uh, when we bring our folks out. It is emotional. I've uh, met firefighters coming out of the building. have had tears in their eyes. Uh, uh, from crawling through and, and uh, looking at the devastation both to the, to the, the, the building and, and the people. And uh, it, it's emotional trying to rescue people, and uh, it is. It's very taxing, and, uh, but, but we're going to be here and throughout it, and we're going to do the very best we can. John, thanks for your help. Thank you. Appreciate you coming okay. by. See you later. Good luck, buddy. All right, that's the story right now from Assistant Fire Chief John Hanson. Marta Waller here. here. You are City watching downtown. pictures from uh, live pictures from two television stations in Oklahoma City, KFOR-TV and KWTV, in the wake of the explosion at the federal building that took away two-thirds of the building and uh, has killed eight people. Six of those uh, dead are children who were in a daycare center that we now understand was on the second floor of that federal building and there are more than 200 people injured. Some of those people are very seriously injured and there are 10 there are 10 area hospitals in Oklahoma City who are caring for the injured. We also understand that there are people who continue who remain trapped in the in the wreckage of this nine-story building and uh, let's listen in right now gentleman I spoke with was in the bottom floor of the building for a meeting when the explosion happened. He said the lights were immediately knocked out and, and there was dust and, and particles everywhere. He said he literally crawled, felt his way out of the building with the gentleman he was meeting with and found two women along the way. He said he thought he was headed out the front of that building but somehow made it out the side. You see a lot of medical personnel behind me. People have, have volunteered from throughout the state. We've seen individuals, we've seen ambulances from Norman, Ponca City, Mustang helping bring the injured in here. Right now, everything here is, is kind of at a standstill because, as you're seeing from the scene, they're having difficulty reaching the injured. But the word is here that they expect the injured who will be brought in from this point on will be the more serious injuries. And, and they are standing by in all of their critical care units to handle right. them.
All right, Teresa, and certainly we would assume that because most of the people who have been able to make it out so far did so on either on their own or were very close uh, to where uh, emergency workers could get to them. Right. Let's add a very uh, unfortunate and unsettling wrinkle to all of this. Things are going to uh, become a, a little more difficult on the rescuers, courtesy of the weather. Dan Threlkeld, tell us about that. Devin, this is a terrible situation anyway, but if we, indeed we do have folks trapped, uh, the last thing that we need is rain compounding the problem, even thunderstorms. Let's take a look at the radar, and you can see the activity across parts of South southwestern Oklahoma causing some problems there the activity in the southern part of the state is still drifting up towards the metro area unfortunately needed in the Oklahoma City area because of this tremendous need from uh, all the injuries and uh, not from just Oklahoma the City itself. this is uh, tape live uh, or not tape live pictures from the Baptist Medical Center in Oklahoma City where the injured did this is one of 10 area hospitals that is uh, taking care of those people who were injured in the explosion that explosion happened at nine o'clock this morning that would be about four and a half hours ago seven o'clock our time uh, 9 a.m uh, oklahoma city time that building apparently there were 500 people um, uh, who were uh, known to be employed there but we're now hearing there could have been as many as 900 people inside the building at the time of the explosion uh, we've had reports that uh, Investigators believe this this uh, bombing explosion was caused by a car bomb, a car packed with car packed with 1,200 pounds of explosives. They also found second and third devices, both of which were larger than the first. That uh, of course caused just mass panic. Uh, people trampled one another in the stampede to get away from the building. There are still people trapped in the building right now. Uh, many of them are having to crawl out of that building. Uh, they, they, the rescue workers are literally crawling on their stomachs to get to some of these people because the, the damage is so extensive. As you see here, eight people are confirmed dead at this time. Of those eight deaths, six were children. Those children were in a daycare center, which we now understand was not on the first floor of the federal building, but on the second floor. It's a nine-story building. Uh, more than 200 people have been injured. Many of those injuries are very, very serious. Uh, we don't know the extent of the injuries at this time. Uh, that will be forthcoming. Right now, they are so busy in Oklahoma City just dealing with the immediate emergency that uh, any number of greater yeah, than that. Dad had just dropped him off at the downtown line. And um, Dad was a couple blocks away when he heard the explosion and went back. And I'm sure glad he did that. Do <laughs> you understand any other children were injured there? Um, yeah, there was quite a few that were quite a injured. Few injured, but they, they were real uh, efficient in getting the kids out and what stuff. Did, at the, what did it look like there? Uh, basically what you've been seeing on the TV, lots of glass, lots of buildings, uh, you know, debris flying around, lots of people with cuts and a lot of stuff. I was just pulling out, I was a couple of blocks away, and it felt like somebody had reared into me in the back of the truck, and I just happened to look back and saw the smoke, and so I just turned it around and ran back up, and uh, uh, from where, where I was, it looked like the smoke was coming out of the wide building, so I was really panicking at that time, but um, it just looked like every building there, I was thinking, well, that must be where the explosion took place because of all the, I was surprised at how many of the other buildings were affected, too. What are the children doing? Do what? What were the children doing? Well, probably just what you think, crying and stuff, you know, with cuts and stuff. They were scared. Just like People involved in the tragedy in Oklahoma City, which has sent shockwaves out to uh, all four corners of the United States. The We've been watching pictures uh, from Oklahoma City, the, uh, the uh, federal building in that city, of course, uh, uh, destroyed this morning at 9 o'clock when a what the uh, investigators believe to be a car bomb uh, with 1200 a car packed with 1200 pounds of explosives uh, exploded in front of that building uh, an enormous crater in the street in front of the building uh, windows shattered throughout the city uh, flying glass uh, being likened to shrapnel many people with uh, lacerations of varying degrees simply from the flying glass we understand there are people trapped in that building uh, many uh, rescue workers are literally crawling on their stomachs to get to some of these people. There are a number of people uh, who remain unaccounted for. Eight people confirmed dead. Six are children. And as we just heard a moment ago, the YMCA, which also provides daycare, is across the street from the federal building in Oklahoma City. And 
There were children uh, in that building who also were injured, but we believe that the uh, children who died were in the daycare center, were in the daycare center. Also, as a result of this bombing, there is heightened security at federal sites throughout the United States. Right now, let's go to Skycam 5. They are flying. They, they are flying over the federal building in Santa Ana, which has also been evacuated. Apparently, there has been a telephoned bomb threat. FBI agents uh, down there evidently received the bomb threat. That building has been evacuated. And uh, this is just one of many buildings across the United States. The federal building in Boston was evacuated after Internal Revenue Service workers found things out of place when they arrived at work this morning. They uh, perhaps would not have been as concerned about that if it had not been for this bombing. The federal building in Fort Worth has been evacuated, and there is also heightened security at federal sites in Nebraska, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington State. Right now, we don't, uh, apparently, the uh, bomb sniff, they, there are bomb sniffing dogs going through this building in Santa Ana right now, and uh, the people who work in that building are expected to be outside for anywhere from one to two hours. The FBI, it is not, evidently isn't a federal building. The FBI leases space in this building. And uh, this is in Santa Ana. So clearly, what has happened in Oklahoma City today has, has uh, caused a rash of bomb threats. Whether they are real or not, no one is going to take any chances. Uh, evacuations, heightened security, as Eric Spillman has reported from the federal building in Westwood. They've closed off all but one entrance to the building, and people are being searched and searched again before they're allowed inside. Employees are having their ID tags checked very carefully. There's an FBI agent. There's an FBI agent down on the first floor of that building. Uh, we will keep you updated on any developments in Santa Ana, of course. Right now, let's go back to pictures of Oklahoma City. We see, and we are going to listen to uh, the television station down there. Let's go to one of our crews in downtown Oklahoma City. News High 9's Gan Matthews is standing by with a terrorism expert. Gan? Kelly and Jennifer, uh, Dr. Stephen Sloan is a recognized uh, terrorism expert at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Sloan, uh, you've been out here uh, all morning. Based on what you know, are you persuaded that uh, what happened here today was an act of terrorism? Unfortunately, it looks very much as if that's the case. What was significant in your judgment uh, regarding uh, the uh, discovery of the second uh, explosive device? That's a very sophisticated technique that has increasingly been used to draw people in, including the rescue personnel, detonate a second explosive device and create additional havoc. It has profound psychological impact. And fortunately, it was, uh, it was discovered and uh, apparently defused yes. before uh, it, could, it could go off. What does this suggest to you about the sophistication, if you will, of the person or persons behind this? The fact that there were at least two bombs, the fact uh, that they selected the target, the level of lethality in regards to the explosive devices indicates that this probably was a rather sophisticated organized uh, attack. Okay, we're familiar with the World Trade Center. We're familiar with uh, Beirut. Why Oklahoma City? I'm troubled by... Good. A little bit of a problem. We are receiving video from two television stations in Oklahoma City, KFOR and KW. TV, and uh, because of that, we do switch back and forth between the two. Now we have a live picture from, uh, in in let's listen in. Actually, half an hour intervals, because what they're finding inside is just so horrible, they cannot handle it. And that's, uh, it, it's unbelievable what, what we're seeing down here. Again, the shot you see right now, emergency crews elevated on the ladder, going in, digging through the rubbles, hoping to find survivors. Unfortunately, a lot of times they are not coming out with that. Uh, here with me now is Officer Neal, who's with the Edmond Police Department. You were inside trying to help rescue people? Yes, uh, our agency sent down several people, just as well as every other agency, and uh, we worked from the first floor up to the ninth, trying to see if there was anybody that, um, uh, victims that needed medical assistance. and. Um, it's, it's just incredible devastation as far as, uh, it, it, it's like being a miner, you're having to dig through walls and ceilings and, and a lot of debris that has collapsed on top of desks. And uh, there's uh, one door I saw that had literally blown through a block wall. Is there much hope for finding many survivors in that building? I would hope there is. Um, I know from what I saw that it, it's, it's a bad situation. You know, we're, we're optimistic and we're doing everything we can. Um, I know that uh, there was 
a lot of people in there digging through the debris. Myself, like I said, we saw a pair of ladies' shoes, and all we could see was the bottom of them, so we spent 20 minutes digging through debris trying to work ourselves to that area, and it turned out that it was just a pair of shoes, and all you could see was the bottoms of them, but, I mean, you have to check them, so that's why it's taken so much time. It is an agonizing process for you all as well. Exactly, and, and the thing is, is um, the stability of the building is still in question. Um, I know that there were several parts when I was up on the 7th and 8th and 9th floors that I felt like the building was moving. So, um, you know, it's something that you have to be very slow and cautious when you're doing that. Okay, Officer Neal, thank you very much. A lot of people out here working very hard. Uh, again, the task that task they face before them is very grim. Again, uh, we mentioned they're sending emergency crews in in half-hour intervals because what they're finding inside your mind cannot imagine, so they don't want them to be overloaded and burned out because they need all the hands here that they can get. Uh, we'll get some more information and get back to you, Devin and Kevin. Okay. Uzi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Dan Threlkeld a minute ago telling us about uh, the possibility of thunderstorms moving in. As you look over the area, what is rain, a uh, really bad rain, going to do to this rescue effort? Uh, well, Devin, they, don't, they do not need any more catastrophes, disasters, and that's exactly what this would bring. Again, as the officer just told you, this building is not very stable. Now, you can imagine what's exposed a lot of brick, a lot of mortar, a lot of sod. When it gets wet, it gets weakened. So there, if rain is moving into the area, that is news we do not need to know. Uh, they're working as hard as they can, uh, but rain would only make this situ a bad situation worse, if that is all possible at this point. Okay. Yuzi, thanks very much. That's incredible. Well, we were talking earlier about some kids. Shirt to, uh, to go downtown to downtown Oklahoma City, uh, where we have the news channels. Cap, real quickly, we've got an explosion that occurred uh, approximately an hour ago in downtown Oklahoma City. Tremendous devastation, a lot of confusion going on right now. And uh, the FBI, obviously, uh, very concerned about this because, as we heard from KTOK radio here in Oklahoma City, and perhaps, perhaps, we are speculating. And uh, Marta Waller here. What you're seeing is unedited videotape shot earlier this morning, shortly after that explosion that uh, destroyed the federal building in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, one of the impacts of this, uh, windows were blown out throughout the city. One uh, young woman who apparently was in bed at the time of the explosion uh, in her apartment about two blocks away said that uh, her friend or her roommate went to the window after hearing the explosion or heard the boom and the shock wave, the time it took him to get to the window literally blew him across the room and uh, she would, the young woman suffered cuts to her legs and her head from the flying glass and as we've reported before uh, that flying glass, in, in, uh, certainly in the immediate area of the explosion and in areas around the city, has been likened to uh, flying shrapnel, and it has cut many, many people have suffered lacerations as a result. The videotape coming out of Oklahoma City is unedited. Uh, some of the pictures are particularly shocking. Many, many people have been seriously injured. Uh, eight people confirmed dead. They, we know that there are people still trapped in the building, uh, what their condition is is not yet known. There was a daycare center on the second floor of the federal building. That daycare center there for the employees. We understand 514 people apparently were assigned to various departments in the federal building in Oklahoma City, but we are now being told that as many as 900 people could have been in that building at the time of the explosion. Uh, a lot, lot of business takes place in the federal building at 9 o'clock in the morning would certainly be it would be late enough in the day that uh, there would be a great deal of uh, uh, foot traffic and people through that building. Ten area hospitals are treating the injured. There are several triage centers. We uh, now are looking at live pictures. Again, this is from KFOR-TV, one of the stations uh, uh, from whom we are uh, receiving pictures of this uh, devastating explosion. This is the north side of the federal building in downtown Oklahoma City and uh, many other buildings have uh, suffered extensive damage as a result of this explosion. Uh, the shock wave, uh, as you can see the building in the foreground, you can see the roof of that building is damaged and uh, the entire front of this building has been blown away. Uh, investigators uh, believe it was a car packed with 1,200 pounds of explosives. They found two other devices, uh, both of which were larger than the first. Neither of those, neither of those detonated. 
Ron Olson, uh, our reporter, Ron Olson, is standing by at the Federal Building in downtown Los Angeles. Security has been heightened everywhere. Good afternoon, Ron. You're at the Roybal Building. Good afternoon, Marta. Yes, I am. Just over here, Carlos, if you can pan right over here, this is the Roybal Federal Building, of course, on Temple Street. This was uh, made famous, I guess, by the uh, two Rodney King federal trials. And then coming back around this way again, just next to it, uh, the corner of Temple in Los Angeles, the old federal building housing uh, any number of uh, federal offices here, including the uh, the uh, the INS and uh, and uh, the DEA and others. Now, normally, uh, normally uh, we don't have uh, federal marshals standing outside uh, at the driveways here, but uh, that's the case today. And we sh we shipped in some tape earlier, and if you can if you can go to that tape right now, the video tape we fed in. Um, out of the ordinary today, just, just from taking a look around, there are federal marshals standing at driveway entrances here. Uh, vans going into the parking garage are being stopped and searched. Bags are being searched. And, uh, of course, at the entrances, uh, as has been the case in the past here, there are metal detectors. Anybody going into these buildings uh, has to empty out their pockets and uh, go through a search, uh, go through a metal detector, uh, pretty much the same as when you arrive at an airport. In the Roybal building, there, uh, there, everything is x-rayed as well. If you throw a briefcase down on the belt, it goes through the x-ray, and they... Uh, they uh, take a look at what's inside. Anything suspicious, you open it up and you have to show the marshals what it is. Uh, Chief Deputy Tony Perez with the U.S. Marshals uh, Service here, uh, which serves these two uh, federal buildings, which are right next to one another on Temple, uh, said he would uh, come down and talk to me at some point this morning. And uh, hopefully uh, Chief Deputy Perez will be down here momentarily. For now, Marta, that's what I've got from the uh, Roy Ball Building and the old federal building here on Temple Street in downtown Los Angeles. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. We'll get back to you in just a little while if you have uh, more news or information for us. And uh, in light of the fact that, that uh, the reports are that it was a, was a car bomb, I think that we're going to see a great deal of security measures being uh, taken, not only with people walking on foot, but also driving into these buildings, particularly with underground parking. Let's listen in now in uh, Oklahoma City. Happened. You know, it rocked me pretty hard. I didn't know what was going on, and I went down there. They uh, asked me if I needed to take somebody to the hospital. I took four or five victims in my truck over to the uh, uh, Baptist Hospital, mm -hmm. left there, come back. Uh, I knew the maintenance man of the federal building, John Chrism, and he was trying to help get blueprints to go down there and shut the... Uh, Auxiliary uh, power off. We went down there, and uh, the generators didn't kick on because they were afraid to get in the building because of all the electrical. Uh, you know, I just was trying to be a concerned person and help, and I just got deeper into it. And then uh, things started falling, and what we're trying to do now is we're trying to get some heavy cranes in here to start okay, trying Mr. to Mr. pick Davis. up the bigger eye beams and stuff off of these people. Oh. and trying to secure the area. Okay, thank you very much, C.A. Davis, uh, doing some heroic work down there in the rubble of that building. Good luck to you, and God bless you. Let's go to Lee Evans. She's at the update desk with more. All right, Kevin. Um, obviously, you said earlier uh, you were talking about the emergency amputation uh, equipment being sent down there, doctors with emergency amputation equipment. Four doctors were sent from University Hospital with emergency amputation kits. Um, they have to do that to cut some of the people out of all that uh, destruction. Also, some more information coming from Southwest Medical Center. They have treated 36 patients so far today. Now, as of right now, they've been able to release 31 of those for minor injuries thank goodness, but they have five in surgery right now for injuries from the blast, injuries resulting from the blast, uh, injuries like glass and fragments embedded in their bodies. Um, they've also been put on disaster alert. They are saying they're preparing for the second wave of patients, which is much worse, they estimate, to be than the first wave that they've already had. Uh, one other thing that we can tell you about Oklahoma City Public Schools, we told you already that one school was affected, and that was Emerson Alternative School, but what's also 
also being effective children who live in the downtown area. So what Oklahoma City Public Schools are doing for, for children who do live in the evacuated area downtown is sending them to Wilson Elementary School today after school. That's at 2215 North Walker. Parents can go get their children there if you are in the downtown or if you reside or live in the downtown evacuated area. You can go pick up your children at 2215 North Walker. They've also put all of their counselors throughout the uh, school district on alert uh, so that if they have any children, obviously there will be some children in the school system who are affected by this, whether it be parents or grandparents or other relatives or friends who were uh, in the mess. Um, there will be some children affected. All counselors have been put on alert so that they can be dispatched to whatever schools they need to go to. Obviously a sad situation down here. We're getting more information minute by minute. We'll keep you posted. Okay, Leah, and speaking of children, we mentioned to you earlier the little girl who uh, had not been able to, they had not been able to connect her with her parents. Uh, we understand the little girl's name is Rebecca, and they have now reunited her with her mother, who had been working at the IRS building. The problem now is uh, her three-and-a-half-year-old brother, Brandon. Blue eyes, reddish, blonde hair, he is still missing. Let's go to uh, Teresa Green, who is at uh, Baptist Medical Center. Teresa. Um, similar situation at this hospital to what is going on at other hospitals locally. They are preparing for the second wave and, and caring for the patients they already have. About 30 patients treated here at Baptist so far. They are dealing with the physical injuries, but as you can imagine, there, there is an emotional toll in this kind of disaster as well. The people I have talked to are, are very shaken. And joining me is Bill Carpenter from the Outpatient Counseling Center here. For people who, who may be relatives, neighbors, for, for survivors of this terrible disaster. What kinds of things can you do? What are they going through? How can you help them cope? Well, it is important to understand how people do respond to uh, disasters such as this, and there's a wide range of response. Uh, we sometimes think there is a predictable one way that people respond, but there are lots of different ways. Uh, folks can get uh, hysterical, uh, they can get teary, or some folks can respond as if nothing has happened at all. And all of those are okay ways of, response, of responding. People will get to what they need to do in their own time and according to their own uh, culture and, and other things that determine how they're going to respond. As far as a neighbor uh, uh, offering help, calling, uh, trying to be with somebody during that time, and uh, sensing what that person wants from you as you're sitting with them or talking with them. And if they seem to want your presence, then stay with them. If not, then uh, offer what you can and go on. And sometimes just the offer is a wonderful gesture of concern and, and compassion. The flip side of all of this, the rescue workers now going in and, and talking about the horrible things that they're seeing. We, we've seen this with other disasters. Um, similar, I imagine, to post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, what kinds of things are they going to be going through in, in the days and weeks ahead just, just by sheer fact of what they're seeing today? I think right now, of course, as they're involved in rescue, they will, they will do well and not show any kind of emotion for the most part. But then as the days go on, as you said, after the, the shock uh, begins to uh, uh, show itself with them, then they will begin to experience a variety of, of responses. And it's important for folk like that to understand that that particular rescue is the source of strange kinds of behavior that may come weeks later. Often people don't relate that to, uh, to the stress and so they have difficulty and wonder why so, so no, and, and I do want to point out that, that I know counselors here and elsewhere throughout the city have mobilized and do want to make themselves available for anyone who, who does need help dealing with this. I'm going to send it back to you now. Okay, Teresa, thank you very much. Down there at Baptist Hospital, we have a gruesome statistic to relate to you now. Uh, unfortunately, the death toll has, rise, uh, has risen for children uh, in particular. Seventeen children now, we understand, have been killed in this explosion. Seventeen added up to two adults who were confirmed earlier, and so the death toll right now stands at 19 deaths, 17 among them children. Let's go to uh, Kent Ogle, who is joining us from University Hospital on the phone, I believe. Kent? Yeah, Dev and I'm at University. And he didn't give us a number, but he said, we're talking to them, we can see them. In some cases, we can reach down through the rubble and hold their hands, and we're going to get to the ones we can, we can get to right now and then try to get to the ones where we have to move the building later. So I'm hopeful that 
somewhere in the translation that this information will turn out to be wrong. We have more survivors than that. Well, I know shortly before we had to evacuate the scene, because again, we were right on this location you can see here, when all of a sudden people started running out when they'd found another bomb and we had to all back up. Right before we left, we could look up into the building and see people standing, a gaping holes. And they obviously were not injured to the point where they were not able to call for help. So we know there were people that just they couldn't get to, and I believe that the, the rescue efforts had to be st and uh, as we have told you, we are getting pictures from two different television stations in Oklahoma City. You just heard the news that the death toll has climbed. 17 children are among the dead. Uh, two adults at this time. 17 children have uh, been killed in this uh, devastating bombing in Oklahoma City. These children... Uh, were in the daycare center on the second floor of the federal building. That daycare center provided for the people who work in that building so their children could be nearby. Nine-story building. The explosion happened at 9 o'clock this morning. We're receiving pictures from, as we said, two different television stations in Oklahoma City. This is video from KFOR-TV. Uh, many, many people suffered serious injuries. Uh, many of the injuries came from flying glass. But as you have seen from the pictures of the building that we have shown you, uh, that building was destroyed. There is, uh, according to reports, a crater in front of the building. It is believed the car packed with 1,200 pounds of explosives was responsible for this, for this uh, explosion. Uh, of course, uh, at this time, terrorism is suspected. There are many people who are injured. A number of these people are in shock. Uh, as is to be expected after an injury like this, or after an explosion like this. They are, we have also been told, they are literally climbing on their hands and knees to get to the injured people who remain trapped inside the building. The situation, of course, is critical. There are 10 area hospitals caring for those people who are injured. There are triage centers to sort out the injuries and make sure that uh, those people who have suffered the most severe injuries get to trauma centers that can care for them adequately. Uh, some of the people will be treated right out in the field. Others will be taken to hospitals perhaps that don't have uh, facilities for, for severe trauma. Also, there were people in the there were children in the YMCA across the street from the federal building. Here we see an aerial photograph of the federal building in downtown Oklahoma City. As you can see, uh, there is uh, really almost nothing left. There's also a lot of concern about the structural integrity of what remains of that building. Uh, rescue workers who've been inside have reported that when they came out or when they were inside up on the sixth, seventh, eighth floors, this was a nine-story building, that in fact they were very, very concerned because they could feel the floors moving. And uh, uh, I would imagine this is a very uh, serious concern on the parts of uh, officials because that building probably has no structural integrity left and could easily collapse. Windows blown out all around the city, certainly in the, uh, uh, the uh, area immediately surrounding the federal building, a great deal of flying glass, broken windows, and other buildings sustained rather considerable damage. The power of this blast was so intense, it could be felt as much as, as, as little, as far as 30 and maybe even 50 miles away. And uh, it was almost a repercussion, uh, according to some of the people who, who were in Oklahoma City. One woman who was in her bed in her apartment a couple of blocks from the federal building said uh, her roommate heard the blast, and in the time it took him to get out of, of bed and walk over to the window, he was blown back across the room, and she suffered cuts to her legs and her head. Uh, not serious, but did suffer cuts to her legs and her head. And of course, we go back to the fact that there was a daycare center on the second floor of this building, and 17 children died in this explosion, which investigators believe at this time was the work of uh, well-organized terrorists. Um, of course, that, ex that uh, investigation is going to continue, but uh, they have a, a major, major disaster to deal with. And we've talked to people from the Red Cross, 
They are anxious for blood donations and cash donations. And of course, here in Southern California, we're no strangers to disaster uh, with earthquakes and fires and floods and mudslides. And uh, anyone in Southern California who wants to help can call the local Red Cross chapter about donating blood or about making a, a donation. Cash is always a good donation when there is a disaster far away because that money can be transferred very quickly. We have also learned that federal buildings across the United States have a, there's tightened security I would I would have to say with with some authority there's tightened security at probably every federal building in the United States at this time there have been evacuations in uh, just precautionary evacuations in Boston Wilmington Delaware in uh, uh, Fort Worth Texas and there have been some bomb threats right here in Santa Ana the FBI received a bomb threat at, at a building where they uh, occupy space in Santa Ana. That building has been evacuated, and they have uh, dr uh, bomb-sniffing dogs searching down there as well. So we're seeing, it's, it really is a ripple effect across the United States. We've seen uh, numerous uh, federal buildings evacuated because of the bombing here in Oklahoma City. Uh, many people uh, absolutely panicked when two more devices were discovered by firefighters. The first one, as we said, is believed to have been 1,200 pounds of explosives packed into a car right in, that was left right in front of the federal building. And then investigators, firefighters, found two more devices, both of which were larger than the first one. They cleared the area, and people who had been there for this first explosion uh, absolutely stampeded to get out of the area. Uh, absolute total panic. Uh, some people were even injured in that because there was so much concern. And certainly you can understand, having gone through one explosion, you would not want to be there. If there was another one, you would want to be as far away as possible. We understand a number of rescue workers uh, were devastated that they had to leave the area because they know there are people still in that building. And uh, let's listen in right now going inside the building. Once There's they started going inside, I was, I was at the site and the two su survivors were brought out at that point prior to the finding of the second bomb device. And at that point, everything was totally uh, demobilized from that area. All personnel were removed. The people who made it out initially after the, the first blast? The people who initially made it out, there was multiple uh, injured victims and I would say probably within the next the first hour they were mobilized out of the area. How do you go about the process of trying to identify people if uh, they were in uh, a state of what you described to us earlier? I think the the Red Cross in Oklahoma City is going to be taking care of that and if there's concern about survivors they should communicate with Red Cross. They're probably going to be the center for that. All right, thank you uh, Dr. Bob for uh, being here with us. We'll go back to you guys. Uh, and we are going to talk right now on the telephone with Dr. Lily Friedland. She's a psychologist here in Los Angeles with the LA Disaster Response Team. Good afternoon, Dr. Friedland. Hello. What, uh, this is clearly going to be devastating, not only to the people who are actually in the building, but to their families, the people who live in the immediate area. What we find with these kind of traumas is that it really does have an effect not only on the immediate ones, but the whole community, and in this case, on the whole nation. What, uh, what do you do I, I, as a member of the uh, uh, a disaster response team? How do you counsel people? What do you do for them? How do you help them get over this kind of trauma? The first thing is to give them permission to have all those feelings. I think most of us were just horrified to hear what happened to the children. And we usually have an easier time letting our feelings out when it relates to children, but also to all the adults that were killed or affected terribly now and what we have to do is to really all go through this period of mourning and not to try to cut off anybody's feelings first of all and then to allow them to recover in that process that sometimes takes weeks and months and sometimes even a year I mean remember the anniversary dates are always critical as well and to help people start building their lives but we can't push that up before they really allow themselves to grieve because this is horrendous. 
You know, Dr. Friedland, I've, I just here in the studio, looking around at the, the people who are here with us today, and we're watching these pictures, and as you well know, we are no strangers to disaster here in Southern California. Absolutely. And, you know, I noticed even for myself, sitting here, you almost feel some of those feelings that you've had after a big earthquake or some other big disaster kind of coming back. You're absolutely right. And here in Southern California, we're particularly vulnerable because we have not had that opportunity to heal over any of them. And we've had about four or five of them in the last few years. You know, the floods, the mm -hmm. fires, the uprisings, the earthquake. And almost before we were able to just sigh and start getting back to normal, we were hit again. So our population is particularly vulnerable to feeling this kind of anxiety and it coming up for us again. I would, as, I would, as well as the fact that, you know, we're talking about the federal building. This is like one of the bulwarks that you think is one of the safest places around. And I think that that shakes up, up our psychological beliefs in terms of what is safe. Right, where you can go. I mean, we expect our workplaces to be, we expect the, our workplaces to sort of be an extension of our homes, where we can go, we can feel comfortable, mm -hmm. we know the people around us, and to have something like this happen, and particularly frightening, is that uh, they believe that this was a car bomb correct, in uh, front of the building. Not even, it wasn't even someone who'd gotten inside the building, evidently. Correct. That's what I've heard as well, which makes us all feel more scared and anxious. Absolutely, because it could happen anywhere. I also uh, wonder, when you have the, the loss of life to children who were in a daycare center in a workplace, uh, that... I think has to add to the feeling of, of grief and how do you deal with the siblings of these children and, and certainly other school children uh, that has to be very very difficult it is and children aren't always articulate they don't always verbalize their feelings what we will see with them is we'll often find sleep problems either not wanting to get out of bed or just wanting to sleep a lot or oftentimes with their parents needing all kinds of security and stability. You know, if, let's say, they put away an old toy that they no longer sleep with, they may want to do that once again. They may not want to eat. They may not want to leave the house because they're very scared. And we just all really need to be very understanding that they're going through their fear reactions and their anxiety. And that needs to be respected and, and dealt with. Absolutely. And for us to, say, you know, to, to show them that we, too, were scared. This was an awful, awful tragedy. I, and, and once again, I just want to go back uh, very briefly for our viewers who uh, know all too well about disasters, and, and I've had that same thought that you just said, that we haven't had a chance to get over any of these. It, it's just been one after the next. Correct. And uh, I do think that uh, our viewers probably will be particularly appreciative of your information to them because it allows them an opportunity to help their own families deal with what they're seeing now. I hope so. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedland. Uh, I very much appreciate your being with us. We're going to take a short break right now. We'll be right back. Still using Western Union to wire money? Next time, use MoneyGram and save now. Uh, the citizens should not, therefore, attempt to take any action against these men. Anyone with information about these two men should provide it immediately to the nearest FBI office. They can also call phone banks that have been especially established to receive that information. We urge people with information to call 1-800-905-1514. That number will become operational at approximately 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This information has been communicated to law enforcement at all levels, domestic and international. The FBI was apparently able to put together the identities of these two individuals because of a truck they rented at a location which Mr. Kennedy did not identify, but which CNN has learned was a rider tr truck uh, which, was rent which was rented at a location in Junction City, Kansas. CNN has spoken to an individual at the rider headquarters who told us uh, that uh, he could not say anything more but that they had turned over all the information they had to the FBI. Shortly after Mr. Kennedy held that news conference in Oklahoma City, U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno had a news conference to follow here in Washington. Here's what she had to say. The government is offering a reward of up to two million dollars 
for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the bombing in Oklahoma City. Although we have many hundreds of leads, we want to make sure that we have all relevant information that could lead to the conviction of all of those involved in this event. The reward will come from contributions from a number of federal agencies. The Treasury Department, which has done a great job and cooperated magnificently in this investigation, will be making a substantial contribution to this fund. As you know, we have hundreds of skilled agents from several agencies working to bring to justice those responsible for the bombing in Oklahoma City. Again, that was U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno announcing that a reward of up to $2 million is being offered by the U.S. government for any information leading to the arrest of those two individuals. In just a moment, I want to bring in our White House correspondent, Wolf Blitzer. I want to bring in Charles Bierbauer, our national correspondent here with me in Washington, and also Stan Bedlington, who is a counterterrorism expert. Before we talk to the three of them, however, I want to once again go over the the descriptions which the FBI has released of these two individuals they are seeking. They don't have the names, obviously. They are calling them John Doe. John Doe, number one, a white male, uh, medium build, 5 feet 10 to 5 feet 11 inches tall, 180 to 185 pounds, with light brown hair, crew cut, and right-handed. The second suspect, John Doe, two, uh, white male, medium build, 5 feet 9 to 5 feet 10 inches, 175 to 180 pounds, with brown hair, with a tattoo visible on his left arm below uh, where a t-shirt sleeve would be, also considered to be possibly a smoker. Now, again, joining me uh, uh, in the studio here, uh, Charles Bierbauer, Stan Bedlington, uh, counterterrorism expert, and at the White House, Wolf Flitzer. Uh, Wolf, what does this say to you about, uh, because you've been a correspondent for many years, you've covered the Middle East for many years, based on this amount of information that the ad administration is able to put out at this point, what does this tell you about how far they've come in their investigation? Well, it's very impressive so far. They've managed to identify the vehicle, in this particular case, a truck which the FBI says was parked directly in front of the federal building in Oklahoma City. The FBI has now concluded that the bomb, which was thousands of pounds, not simply 1,000 or 1,200 pounds, thousands of pounds, according to the FBI agent in charge, consisted of both fertilizer and fuel oil, a combination that has been used in previous car bombings. The truck uh, was, as I said, parked directly in front of the building. The FBI director, Louis Free, says that while these two individuals, these two suspects, are not yet on the 10 most wanted list, they are as important as any others, and that's why this $2 million reward is being, uh, uh, is being offered. As far as a Middle East connection, the FBI, as well as Attorney General Janet Reno, refused to speculate, refused to say whether there is or is not. They refused to say whether these two men are of Middle Eastern origin. All of this remains very, very unclear at this point. A lot of speculation given the nature of the bombing that it could have been some sort of Middle East related incident. But at this point, the FBI and the Attorney General are staying very far away from making any of those hard and fast allegations. All right, well, Blitzer, uh, stay with us for just a minute. It might be interesting to point out right now that just recently the FBI upped the reward for the suspected bombers of the Pan Am 101 flight to $4 million, and they put the two Libyans on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. So uh, it gives you some idea of the amount of money that's out there. With me in the studio now, Charles uh, Bierbauer, I want to come to you. But Stan Bedlington, to you first. Uh, you worked at the CIA for a number of years, and as we were listening to the FBI news conference, you said there was a clear ambiguity in what uh, Mr. Kennedy was saying. Yes, I think that was raised by some of the questioners. Um, I think the new information seems to change the direction of the in investigation somewhat. You know, the various reports we received during the day seemed possibly to suggest a Middle East or an international connection. Uh, um, of course, the uh, detention of the uh, witness in London being a manifestation of that. Now we have composite um, pictures of white males, perhaps indicating there is a domestic connection. This ambiguity has yet to be resolved. Charles Bierbauer, uh, it, it, see, it struck me that what Agent Kennedy said was very carefully limited to the information they have about the vehicle. In fact, he didn't, even, he didn't even give us the information that it came from rider truck rentals. He said it was a vehicle, it was used in the bombing, and these two individuals, he said, have been identified in connection with that truck. He was very careful not to comment on any of the other 
uh, theories, stories, or whatever that are out there. Well, that's, I think, the, the way a good FBI agent is trained to be. You can, you can do a lot with small pieces of a, of a vehicle, even after it's been blown up. Apparently, they did find the vehicle identification number, which every car or truck carries, and you start to trace things back from there. Uh, yes, there, and there's great caution in this town uh, about pointing any fingers towards anyone, particularly towards the Middle East, because no one wants to particularly make that mistake. And yet, many people I've been talking to, mostly on Capitol Hill, say that this had all the earmarks of, of a Middle Eastern type terrorism. Uh, and these are people who are on the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees. Uh, I, th I think Mr. Bellington is right. This has thrown a new element in here. Uh, but white male does not exclude people who are necessarily a, of Middle Eastern backgrounds. It does not exclude a connection. Uh, I frankly don't know what it is. No one I've talked to can say, yes, this is exactly what it's about. Uh, we, we've picked up uh, other elements on the trail here. There's no question about that and it will remain to see exactly where they lead, but there are some good details there. Well, Mr. Bedlington, I mean, we, we keep, everyone, is, as Charles just said, keeps talking about the, the Middle East signature uh, for this type bombing, car bombing, uh, the fertilizer, fuel oil, explosive, the same sort of thing used in the World Trade Center bombing. Are there any other terrorist acts uh, that, that you can think of in recent times that would point in some other direction, domestic or international? No, not at all. Uh, I have no recollection, recollection of any sort of similar attack. I would, however, point out that there is something called the copycat effect. Uh, we've had successful car bombings by other terrorist groups, including the World Trade Center. This has been well publicized. Uh, there are a number of books available to tell people how to construct one of these bombs. Uh, so the copycat effect could come into play here. Right, and you also have the Pan Am 103, which I mentioned a minute ago, yep. uh, the, the flight, uh, what, three, four years ago now, where they are still searching uh, for the suspects there, and as we just said a moment ago, they are, they are raising the, uh, the reward uh, that the U.S. government is willing to pay for information leading to that. In, in the Pan Am case, there are the, the suspects are two Libyans who are uh, ensconced in Libya and have not been turned over, so there's a different circumstance uh, very much at play there. That's, th and thank you for pointing that out. Wolf, uh, are people that you talk to at the White House uh, telling you that there's any more or much more information out there that they are on the verge of releasing, or are they telling you that, that this is really all they have to go on at this point? Well, they're suggesting that this investigation is moving along very impressively and that there is more information out there, but this is as far as the FBI is willing to go publicly at this point. Weldon Kennedy, the uh, FBI agent in charge, did say something very intriguing in response to tough questioning from reporters in Oklahoma City. He suggested that there could be some element of revenge given the nature of all of the various federal agencies that were located in that federal building in Oklahoma City. The fact that uh, these two are white males does not necessarily preclude a Middle East connection. It doesn't necessarily suggest that there is one. We do know that earlier today, the Defense Secretary, William Perry, did publicly say at a photo opportunity uh, here in Washington that the Pentagon was detailing several Arabic language interpreters to the FBI to help in the investigation. We do know from senior administration officials here at the White House and elsewhere in Washington that their working assumption over the past 24 hours has been that there probably was some sort of Middle East connection, although they're stopping short of actually saying that. There is always, of course, the possibility, and this is pure speculation, that uh, some non-Middle Easterners could have been hired out, freelance, or whatever, to go rent a truck if that were, in fact, uh, what the FBI is suggesting in this particular case. The bottom line is, though, we simply don't know if there was a Middle East connection or not. The FBI and the Attorney General are refusing to go that far. That's right. And in fact, when Attorney General Reno was asked about that comment by the Secretary of Defense, she said uh, that she didn't want to make any characterizations, that all leads were being followed, and she didn't want to uh, say whether that uh, was going to lead to something specific or not. All right, I want to say thanks to all three of our panel members, to Wolf Blitzer at the White House, to Charles Bierbauer here in the studio with me, and to Stan Bedlington. Thank you all for being with us, and now we want to go to Atlanta for our continuing coverage of the aftermath of yesterday's bombing in Oklahoma City. Now to Lou Waters and to Natalie Allen. <laughs> The ink 
fries and the word spits. And the question is raised and the answer is found. And the picture talks and the doctor sees. And the speaker sings and the plant hums. And the engine glides and the blades fly and the sky clears. For people, for the economy, for the planet. Electricity, the power to make life better. And the day is done and the two are one. And the cares all slip away. They keep missing out. Those men over 50 who have symptomatic BPH, an enlargement of the prostate which causes urinary symptoms. Think about it. Does going to the bathroom keep you from getting a good night's sleep? Are you bothered by the frequent need to go? The feeling of urgency? Then the sensation that your bladder isn't completely empty? Now there's help. Read about it in this informative free brochure. Call toll-free now for your complimentary copy. It includes an important questionnaire for you to complete and discuss with your doctor. The brochure also offers information about BPH, its symptoms and treatment options. Urinary symptoms might also be a sign of a more serious condition. To order your helpful free brochure, call now 1-800-424-5533. Nature makes flowers beautiful. At 1-800-Flowers, we've developed a way to make them last. Our florists use a special 10-step freshness care system, a process that increases water absorption by the flowers and provides the necessary nutrients. That's why at 1-800-Flowers, we can guarantee your arrangements will stay fresh for a week. In our business, when people tell us we're fresh, we say thank you. Just call our name or visit our stores. In the effort to help people work better together, there's no limit to how far some companies will venture. This isn't about being big and strong, it's about being together. Lotus introduces Note Suite. Five leading desktop applications for team computing, integrated with Lotus Notes. It will change the way companies work, because it will change the way people work, together. We what if we did a quarter? I like what you've done with this. I do too. It's the ultimate. Crisp bacon, egg, and two cheeses on a fresh made-from-scratch biscuit. The ultimate omelet biscuit at Hardee's. Right now available on our 99-cent breakfast value menu for your ultimate enjoyment. Ultimate omelet, just 99 cents. Fresh from the kitchen at Hardee's. And hello again. We continue with our coverage of the Oklahoma City bombing and some new developments in that investigation and the search for suspects. Hello, I'm Natalie Allen. I'm Lou Waters. It's uh, more than 24 hours, but things are happening fast in the hunt for the Oklahoma City uh, bombers. First, a uh, short while ago, the FBI issued arrest warrants for two men. These are the composite uh, sketches. Uh, the names are unknown, both described as uh, medium height, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, one with a crew cut, one with longer brown hair. Uh, the one on the right of your screen has a tattoo on his left arm. Uh, the names, as I said, are unknown. The hotline number for information and a $2 million award for uh, the arrest and conviction of the men is listed on your screen. The FBI says the bomb used in yesterday's attack probably weighed several thousand pounds. The FBI agent in charge in Oklahoma City said he is not aware of any suspects in custody in connection with the case. In another development, a man described as a Jordanian-American is being flown to the United States from Britain. He is described as a possible witness. The Italian news agency ANSA names that man as Abraham Abdullah Ahmad. FBI sources tell CNN the man is believed to have been in Oklahoma City yesterday. Diplomatic sources tell CNN's Ralph Begleiter the man's luggage, which arrived ahead of him in Rome, contained equipment that, quote, could be used to make an explosive device. Rescuers are still combing the bomb ruins of the federal building, but they are searching very carefully because the severely damaged building could collapse further. Structural engineers have identified sections most likely to shelter survivors, and the search has focused on those areas. The searchers are using sensitive microphones and trained dogs. Their chief concern, find the living. 
but more often than not, they have had to do their work by crawling over the dead. At this point, 36 people have been confirmed dead, 12 of those children, more than 400 people are injured. CNN's Bernard Shaw is in Oklahoma City where he's been covering events. He joins us now. Bernie. Thank you, Natalie. As word ripples through Oklahoma City about the announced suspects, the people in this building are concentrating on the business at hand. We talked a short while ago with Deputy Fire Chief John Hansen. He told us that unofficial, unofficially at least 20, maybe 22 bodies had been located, even though the official toll is what you just reported. A call went out some time ago for bed sheets. They had run out of body bags. They expect to find more bodies. One fireman who had been in there on his two-hour stint reported seeing at least six bodies. But officials here are hoping that there are people still alive inside this building behind us in pockets, if they could only reach them. One of the ways they're trying to reach these people is through the rescue service using dogs from here in Oklahoma and from out of state. Sharon Kyle joins us. Thank you, Bernard. I'm with Search and Rescue Dogs of Oklahoma, along with teams from Arizona, Sacramento, California, and Missouri. Uh, we train our own dogs that we own. We train them in air scenting and trailing. These are disaster trained dogs. They're trained to go through rubble and find the scent of a live human being. Now this is Raven, and she's two years old. What kind of dog is she? She's a flat-coated retriever. Now, the dog core here, if I can call them that, you've had some successes in the last 24 hours. That's correct. Two members from our team were searching from 11 yesterday morning till 3 this morning. Uh, their dogs both had alerts, that is, their dogs picked up the scent of that 15-year-old female that was later extricated from the basement area. She came out at 10.30 uh, last night. I believe so. What does a dog like Raven do once she spots someone alive in that wreckage? Each dog will have a particular thing that they could do easily. A lot of dogs are trained and encouraged to dig and scratch and bark at the location where they get the strongest human scent. Thereby, the handler can be away from the dog, the dog can alert on where they're getting the scent, and that place can be flagged for the extrication people to come in and start digging the rubble. This morning I was watching as one of the members of the rescue corps, one of the canines was, well there were about four or five firemen, they were waiting and they, you, they were bent over the wreckage and they were slowly waiting for the dog to come forth and the dog just came through the rubble. Yeah, a lot of times when a dog gets an alert they'll start clearing the rubble and then there's no human being there. They'll send the dog into that pocket that they've cleared to detect at the point where the scent is strongest and then the firefighters will go into that point and start clearing more. It's almost like building a tunnel with the human scent on the other side coming through, leading the dog to that area that they can dig through. Well, our thanks to you, Sharon, and also to Raven for taking the time out from your operation. Thank thanks you. so much. And very quickly to tell you briefly, uh, Chief Deputy Chief Hansen told us that in a little while, maybe before uh, dusk, they're going to be going in and they're going to take some of these floors out that they can get to. They have been shoring up the building back here, portions of it, with railroad ties and what have you. Once they stabilize that, they will go in, pull out what they can, and continue looking for people in these pockets. As I say, they have been working so hard that I don't think people universally know here at the scene that there are two suspects that composite drawings have been dispersed around the world, but you get the sense that these people are working on trying to save lives. For now, that's the latest from this tragic site in Oklahoma City. I'm Bernard Shaw. Lou, Natalie, back to you. Bernie, thank you. The picture of an anguished firefighter clutching a baby filled the front pages of newspapers around the world today. The bloody child became a symbol of the Oklahoma horror and the innocence of its victims. It's now known the child died at the scene, one of at least 12 children known dead. Firefighter Chris Field says a police officer handed the child to him covered with insulation and dust. Field says he never learned the child's name, age, or sex. He says all he could think about was his own two-year-old son. Many of the youngest victims had just been dropped off at the second floor daycare center at the Alfred Moore Federal Building. 
Hundreds of workers helped set up the on-site facility a few years ago. They were proud of it, so they could drop in on their kids during their work day. But it could be days before rescue and recovery teams even reach what was once that center. Well, unfortunately, the daycare center area is one of those that's under the pancake collapse, and uh, they're doing their best to come in from the backside uh, as best they can with, uh, again, the listening devices and the, uh, the cameras. Uh, but that's going to be the longer, tedious process is the rubble outside the building. And, and the best guess I got from uh, the team this morning was uh, after putting their heads together through the night and looking at it, we're probably looking at four to six days before they can give me any high percentage of uh, assurance that the building is clear. The process is at times painstakingly slow as rescue crews try to locate survivors without further injuring people or destroying evidence that could lead to suspects. Rescue workers in Oklahoma City have been having trouble, as we said, getting through the rubble to trap victims. They're afraid the weakened structure might collapse further. But yesterday, rescuers actually were crawling through the ruins, and one of them, a doctor, participated in a procedure he never thought he'd have to perform. They had discovered a 20-year-old uh, female in the basement of the federal building and were unable to access her or secure the area to allow access by the medical team until we got there around 12.30. At that point in time, most of the medical teams had left into a triage area several blocks away, and therefore our unit was the only one left, and there were several independent physicians on the premises who were asked to go down and assess uh, the 20-year-old uh, female. And at that point in time, we discovered that her leg was uh, trapped under uh, thousands of pounds of concrete and debris and she was in a crawl space, uh, only accessible on your hands and knees, and she was in a foot and a half of water and had been that way for a couple of hours. When you found her, was she conscious? She was conscious. She was alert and talking. Uh, she remarkably asked about some of the colleagues around her. Uh, she also knew uh, who we were and what we were trying to do. The unfortunate part of that was that it took another couple of hours in order to secure the area enough to where we felt that the uh, surrounding concrete and uh, the ceiling of the basement wasn't going to cave in on the firemen, the police officers, and the medical team. So we were removed from the area at least on two different occasions. Uh, one, the first time for a, uh, another bomb discovery, which turned out to be false, and uh, the second time because the wall began to vibrate and they felt like it was uh, going to come down and, and crush us all. Uh, but her, her cry at that time was, please don't leave me. When we decided to do the procedure, uh, Dr. Sullivan decided that he might be able to do it if we could free up some uh, space for us. And therefore, we assessed, uh, assessed it by enabling the fire crew to remove the rebar, access her, and the amputation was carried out with the medical team, with, with our assistance, um, while Dr. Sullivan was on his stomach in a foot and a half of water. I was gonna say, how difficult a job is it to do something like that, something that serious, working under those conditions? Well, it's, it's, we had no choice. Uh, we attempted to try to remove her with a halter and a, and a rope, and uh, we were unable to do it. She was uh, no arteries, no veins, so we were unable to give her any IV fluids uh, for which we could provide pain medication. And um, at that point in time, it was either amputate her leg or leave her uh, to fall into a coma. And, uh, of course, we weren't going to let that happen without trying to save her life. How, how was she when you told her what you had to do? Well, she was uh, verbally uh, wanting us to try something else, which we did. And then we came to the conclusion, which we shared with her, that we were unable to do it. And obviously, there was no choice. Have you checked to see how she's doing today? I've called, and she's stable. Uh, they did another uh, part of the procedure at the hospital and she's alive. Uh, she's missing her right lower leg below the knee, but she is alive, and I think she has a, uh, a good life ahead of her. We have heard from her. She has been able to talk with reporters today. The amazing thing about her, she is Amy Petty, is being in that predicament where she was, she was able to ask the rescuers, what about my colleagues? One of the wonderful stories uh, about a tragedy like this is the, the human factor that comes together like it has in Oklahoma City. It's, it's wonderful to see. We, in a couple of minutes, will be talking to Martha Crenshaw, who's a professor of government at Wesleyan uh, University in Middletown, Connecticut, who is an expert on terrorism. We'll talk to us about that and the Oklahoma explosion. That's when we come back.
This is the place for complete coverage of live breaking news wherever it occurs. This is CNN. 20 years after the war, CNN returns to Vietnam to search for answers and to hear the very personal stories from those who fought on both sides with exclusive interviews with former Commander Generals Westmoreland and Jump. Unprecedented live coverage from Ho Chi Minh City with Peter Arnett at the former U.S. Embassy, Bruce Morton at Kent State, and Larry King and Bernard Shaw at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Vietnam, 20 years later. All next week on CNN. Tonight on CNN, at 7.30, Lou Dobbs looks at corporate relief efforts for bombing victims on Money Line. Then at 8, live coverage from Oklahoma City continues with Lyndon Soles and Bobby Batista. At 8.30, Terrorism in America on Crossfire. Larry King goes live to Oklahoma and takes your calls at 9. And at 10, an in-depth look at what this tragedy means to America in a CNN special, Terror in the Heartland. That's all tonight, beginning at 7.30 Eastern on CNN. This is CNN. The explosion in Oklahoma has inspired a tightening of security in federal buildings all across the United States. New Yorkers trying to get into the Jacob Javits federal building had to go through an elaborate screening process today. The White House has ordered all federal facilities to take any necessary precautions to prevent further attacks. Despite the inconvenience, folks we talked with seem to approve of the tougher security measures. I don't think it will happen again, and I, I think everybody is pretty much alert right now. I feel pretty safe. Because of this that happened in Oklahoma, the same thing, and people are really concerned, wondering if it's going to happen again. It's just uh, it's a really bad situation, you know. It shouldn't take, you know, something unfortunate like that to happen for everyone to come together and say, look, what are we going to do about security? Obviously, it's lacking here in New York, and unfortunately, it was lacking out there in Oklahoma, you know, but who was expecting it? It's a big concern. It's a big problem. There have been bomb scares and evacuations of government buildings in seven cities since the attack on Oklahoma yesterday morning, shortly past 9 a.m. local time. None of the bomb scares were proved legitimate. Understanding the kind of mentality that could carry out this kind of murderous attack is not easy. Joining us now from Washington, Martha Crenshaw of Wesleyan University, who's been studying the unique processes of the terrorist mind. Ms. Crenshaw, in the past 30-some uh, hours or so, we've heard the question over and over again, who could do this sort of thing, especially uh, as related to the children. Uh, Vice President of the United States was saying this morning, who could do this kind of thing with, with the children in the daycare center, uh, positioned so vulnerably to uh, this bomb? The President of the United States calling them evil and cowards. Uh, they don't seem, to be my, uh, don't seem to mind being called cowards, however. Well, unfortunately, we have evidence that there are a fair number of people who are both willing and able to commit such actions. I'm not sure that in this case the targets were deliberately children. I think that they were probably an afterthought insofar as we can know anything about the motives. It would appear to be the fact that it was simply a public building. But it is certainly true that the people who commit these actions don't care whether they're children there or not. I know it's difficult to uh, sort through what kind of people could have committed this attack in Oklahoma City since we have the ambiguity uh, uh, with law enforcement officials now of whether it may have been a domestic or a possible uh, Middle East influenced attack. Generally, is there a way to determine the psychology of someone who would drive a 2,000-pound bomb in a truck up into a public place aiming to kill as many people as possible? Well, we know something about the psychology of such people, but obviously our knowledge is very limited, in part because many of the people who commit such actions do not survive their actions. We're familiar with the so-called uh, suicide bombings, which occurred uh, primarily in Lebanon and also now in Israel. Uh, we do not have a lot of evidence. In some cases, we know people have been coerced into such actions and that the people who actually commit the actions are not the people who plan them. That might be the case in this incident, but again, it is far too early to know, and I must say that the cautious stance taken by American lawmakers is entirely commendable. 
So because of this lack of understanding of how these mines work, especially in the case of suicide bombers, there's really not much you can do to prevent it, is there? There is little that you can do to prevent it, although certainly everything that we can know about this sort of subject is, is worthwhile and valuable to us. I think we thought for so long that the United States was an exception, that it would not happen here. Uh, when the World Trade Center bombing happened, we thought it's a one-time thing, the perpetrators have been apprehended, they've been put on trial, and I'm not sure that we, that we thought enough about the possibilities. The opportunities have always been there. The question was whether we had groups or individuals who wanted to take advantage of those opportunities. And we need to ask ourselves, I think, what kind of motives, what kind of causes, what sort of ideologies might motivate the people who would do this. We may have to wait until we can get more information, but when we can get more information, certainly we need to look at this incident and compare it with others worldwide, not just in the United States. Well, as you said, uh, the United States uh, for so long has seemed to uh, think that it might be immune from this sort of thing. Now, with the second bombing that seems so similar to the first one at the World Trade Center, how, how will that change our own psychology? I think there'll be a much greater fear. Uh, that there'll be certainly be a good deal of apprehensiveness, uh, uh, a great deal of, of uh, a desire to find someone to blame. Uh, to find someone to punish. I think people will feel frustrated and feel angry. Although generally such reactions are short-lived and I think in the immediate aftermath of incidents such as this and other incidents of violence in the United States, assassination attempts against presidents for example, we find an immediate rush of security measures, great deal of apprehension, a lot of defensive measures and then within months a sort of return to normalcy, which in part is desirable because we can't live under the threat of terrorism all the time. But I think it does mean that sometimes we let our security measures slip a little bit when actually if someone were going to follow an action by another act of revenge or a follow-up, it's going to take them many months, indeed perhaps a year or two years to plan it. Incidents such as this car bombing took a great deal of planning and organization to bring off, even though it appears that the suspects were fairly quickly apprehended if they are indeed the people who are responsible. So the sort of lead time to plan an incident is very long, whereas our memory of the past incident tends to be very short. Do you mean to suggest that this may have happened sooner, the World Trade Center, and this bombing had our, uh, our security measures not slipped? No, but I, I'm simply noting that there is a pattern of an immediate attention to the issue of security. Mm -hmm. And then as time passes, one begins to think that perhaps one has overreacted. I think it's a natural public reaction, a natural emotional reaction in many ways, and also a natural reaction on the part of the government, which has many different issues to be preoccupied with, and terrorism then slips back. I think, however, that after this incident, it being the second major incident, and obviously of an, e an enormous destructiveness, an enormously painful, uh, event in United States history that that we will I believe be more perhaps think longer and think over the longer run in terms of how to prevent these sorts of actions I'm sure that the US government authorities will start thinking immediately about ways in which these things can be prevented but prevention is very difficult one doesn't want to underestimate the difficulty of preventing some sort of violent action against a public building in the United States we have many public buildings, and there is a contagion effect of terrorism uh, that, that leads others uh, to imitate these sorts of actions. And it is possible to imitate this sort of action. But again, one cannot protect every public building. There are far too many. Is there or do, do you see any correlation between the end of the Cold War and, uh, say, the Persian Gulf War? Uh, the lack of the nuclear threat and a, now a different kind of a threat with, that we're just now becoming more and more aware of because of incidents such as this yesterday? Well, I guess since I've been studying terrorism for 20 or 25 years, it's hard for me to say that it's a new threat. It's not a new threat. It's a threat that's been with us for a long time. Uh, we may not have noticed it as much, but certainly car bombings began at least in the 1970s in Northern Ireland. There have been major bombings in London, in Paris. Uh, I do, however, think that there may be some association between the Gulf War. I don't see a strong association with the end of the Cold War because we assumed some of the time during the Cold War.